Act One of The Double Dealer by William Congreve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Double Dealer by William Congreve. To my dear friend, Mr. Congreve, on his comedy called The Double Dealer. Well, then, the promised hour is come at last. The present age of wit obscures the past. Strong were our sires, and as they fought, they writ, conquering with force of arms and dint of wit. Theirs was the giant race before the flood, and thus, when Charles returned, our empire stood. Like Janus, he the stubborn soil manured. With rules of husbandry, the rankness cured tamed us to manners when the stage was rude and boisterous english wit with art endued our age was cultivated thus at length but what we gained in skill we lost in strength our builders were with want of genius cursed the second temple was not like the first till you the best vitruvius come at length our beauties equal but excel our strength firm doric pillars found your solid base the fair corinthian crowns the higher space thus all below is strength and all above is grace in easy dialogue is fletcher's praise he moved the mind but had no power to raise great johnson did by strength of judgment please yet doubling fletcher's force he wants ease in differing talents both adorn their age, one for the study, t'other for the stage. But both to Congreve justly shall submit, one matched in judgment, both all matched in wit. In him all beauties of this age we see, Etheridge his courtship, Southern's purity, the satire, wit, and strength of manly wickery. All this in blooming youth you have achieved nor are your foiled contemporaries grieved so much the sweetness of your manners move we cannot envy you because we love fabius my joy in scipio when he saw a beardless consul made against the law and join his suffrage to the votes of rome though he with hannibal was overcome thus old romano bowed to raphael's fame and scholar to the youth he taught became Oh, that your brows my laurel had sustained! Well had I been deposed, if you had reigned. The father had descended for the son, for only you are lineal to the throne. Thus when the state one Edward did depose, a greater Edward in his room arose. But now not I, but poetry is cursed, for Tom the second reigns like Tom the first. But let him not mistake my patron's part, nor call his charity their own desert. Yet this I prophesy, thou shalt be seen, though with some short parenthesis between, high on the throne of wit, and seated there, not mine, that's little, but thy laurel wear. Thy first attempt, an early promise made, that early promise, this has more than paid. So bold, yet so judiciously you dare, that your least praise is to be regular, Time, place, and action may with pains be wrought, but genius must be born, and never can be taught. This is your portion, this your native store. Heaven, that but once was prodigal before, to Shakespeare gave as much. She could not give him more. Maintain your post, that's all the fame you need, for tis impossible you should proceed. Already I am worn with cares and age, and just abandoning the ungrateful stage, unprofitably kept at heaven's expense. I live a rent charge on his providence. But you, whom every muse and grace adorn, whom I foresee to better fortune born, be kind to my remains, and, oh, defend against your judgment, your departed friend. Let not the insulting foe my fame pursue, but shade those laurels which descend to you, and take for tribute what these lines express. You merit more, 
nor could my love do less. John Dryden Prologue, spoken by Mrs. Bracegirdle Moors have this way, as story tells, to know whether their brats are truly got or not. Into the sea the newborn babe is thrown, there, as instinct directs, to swim or drown, a barbarous device to try if spouse has kept religiously her nuptial vows. Such are the trials poets make of plays, only they trust to more inconstancies. So does our author, this his child commit, to the tempestuous mercy of the pit, to know if it be truly born of wit. Critics avaunt, for you are fish of prey, and feed like sharks upon an infant play. Be every monster of the deep away, let's have a fair trial and a clear sea. Let nature work, and do not damn too soon, for life will struggle long ere it sink down, and will at least rise thrice before it drown. Let us consider, had it been our fate, thus hardly to be proved legitimate. I will not say, we'd all in danger been, were each to suffer for his mother's sin. But by my troth I cannot avoid thinking, how nearly some good men might have escaped sinking. But, heaven be praised, this custom is confined, alone to the offspring of the muse's kind. Our Christian cuckolds are more bent to pity. I know not one more husband in the city. If the good man's arms the chopping bastard thrives, for he thinks all his own that is his wife's. Whatever fate is for this play designed, the poet's sure he shall some comfort find. For if his muse has played him false, the worst that can befall him is to be divorced. You husbands judge, if that is to be cursed. Dramatis Personae Maskwell, a villain, pretended friend to Melophont, gallant to Lady Touchwood, and in love with Cynthia. Read by Son of the Exiles Lord Touchwood, Uncle to Melophont, read by Larry Wilson Melophont, promised to, and in love with Cynthia, read by Adrian Stevens Careless his friend, read by Thomas Peter. Lord Froth, a solemn coxcomb, read by Alan Mapstone. Brisk, a pert coxcomb, read by Mike Manalakis. Sir Paul Pliant, a uxorious, foolish old knight, brother to Lady Touchwood, and father to Cynthia, read by Todd. Lady Touchwood, in love with Melophont. Recorded by Matea Bracic. Cynthia, daughter to Sir Paul by a former wife, promised to Melophont. Read by Lydia. Lady Froth, a great coquette, pretender to poetry, wit, and learning. Read by Devorah Allen. Lady Pliant, insolent to her husband and easy to any pretender. Read by Sonia. Say Grace, a chaplain, read by Algie Pug. Boy, read by A.M.B. Sweet Thirteen. Footman, read by Algie Pug. Stage directions, read by Dave Lance. The scene, the gallery in the Lord Touchwood's house, with chambers adjoining. Act One. Scene One. A gallery in the Lord Touchwood's home, with chambers adjoining. Enter Careless, crossing the stage, with his hat, gloves, and sword in his hands, as just risen from table, Melophont following him. Ned, Ned, whither so fast? What? Turn flincher? Why, you will not leave us? Where are the women? I'm weary of gustling, and begin to think them the better company. Then thy reason staggers, and thou'rt almost drunk. No, Faith, but your fools grow noisy, and if a man must endure the noise of words without sense, I think the women have more musical voices and become nonsense better. Why, they are at the end of the gallery, retired to their tea and scandal, according to their ancient custom, after dinner. But I made a pretense to follow you, because I had something to say to you in private, and I am not like to have many opportunities this evening. And here is this coxcomb most critically come to interrupt you. Scene two. To them, brisk. Boys, boys, lads, where are you? What, do you give ground? Mortgage for a bottle, huh? Careless, this is your trick. You're always spoiling company by leaving it. And thou art always spoiling company by coming into it. 
Pooh! Ha ha ha! I know you envy me. Spite, proud spite by the gods, and burning envy. I'll be judged by Meliphant here. Who gives and takes raillery better than you or I? Pshaw, sure, man, when I say you spoil company by leaving it, I mean you leave nobody for the company to laugh at. <laughs> I think there I was with you. Ha, huh, Meliphant? Oh, my word, Brisk. That was a home thrust. You have silenced him. Oh, my dear Meliphant, let me perish if thou art not the soul of conversation, the very essence of wit and spirit of wine. The deuce take me if there were three good things said, or one understood, since thy amputation from the body of our society. <laughs> he, I think that's pretty and metaphorical enough. You gad, I could not have said it out of thy company. Careless, huh? My, what is't? Oh, mon coeur. What is it? <laughs> Nay, gad, I'll punish you for want of apprehension. The deuce take me if I tell you. No, no, hang him. He has no taste. But, dear Brisk, excuse me, I have a little business. Prithee, get thee gone. Thou seest we are serious. We'll come immediately, if you'll but go in and keep up good humour and sense in the company. Prithee do. They'll fall asleep else. Egad, so they will. Well, I will, I will. Gad, you shall command me from the zenith to the nadir. But the deuce take me if I say a good thing till you come. But prithee, dear rogue, make haste. Prithee, make haste. I shall burst else. And yonder your uncle, my lord Touchwood, swears he'll disinherit you, and Sir Paul Pliant threatens to disclaim you for a son-in-law. And my lord Froth won't dance at your wedding tomorrow, nor the deuce take me. I won't write your epithalamium, and see what a condition you're like to be brought to. Well, I'll speak but three words and follow you. Enough, enough. Careless, bring your apprehension along with you. Scene three. Melophont, careless. Pert coxcomb. Faith, tis a good-natured coxcomb and has very entertaining follows. You must be more humane to him. At this juncture it would do me service. I'll tell you, I would have mirth continued this day at any rate. Though patience purchase folly, and attention be paid with noise, there are times when sense may be unseasonable as well as truth. Prithee, do not wear none to-day, but allow Brisk to have wit, that thou mayst seem a fool. Why, how now? Why this extravagant proposition? Oh, I would have no room for serious design, for I am jealous of a plot. I would have noise and impertinence keep my lady Touchwood's head from working, for hell is not more busy than her brain, nor contains more devils than that imagination's. I thought your fear of her had been over. Is not tomorrow appointed for your marriage with Cynthia? And a father, Sir Paul Pliant, come to settle the writings this day on purpose? True, but you shall judge whether I have not reason to be alarmed. None besides you and Maskwell are acquainted with the secret of my Aunt Touchwood's violent passion for me. Since my first refusal of her address, she has endeavoured to do me all ill offices with my uncle yet has managed them with that subtlety that to him they have borne the face of kindness, while her malice, like her dark lanthorn, only shone upon me where it was directed. Still, it gave me less perplexity to prevent the success of her displeasure than to avoid the importunities of her love, and of two evils I thought myself favoured in her aversion. But whether urged by her despair and the short prospect of time she saw to accomplish her designs, whether the hopes of revenge or of her love, terminated in the view of this my marriage with Cynthia, I know not. But this morning she surprised me in my bed. Was there ever such a fury? Tis well nature has not put it into her sex's power to ravish. Well, bless us, proceed. What followed? What at first amazed me, for I looked to have seen her in all the transports of a slighted and revengeful woman, but when I expected thunder from her voice and lightning in her eyes, I saw her melted into tears and hushed into a sigh. It was long before either of us spoke. Passion had tied her tongue and amazement mine. 
In short, the consequence was thus. She omitted nothing that the most violent love could urge or tender words express, which, when she saw, had no effect, but still I pleaded honour and nearness of blood to my uncle, and then came the storm I feared at first, for, starting from my bedside like a fury, she flew to my sword, and with much ado I prevented her doing me, or herself, a mischief. Having disarmed her, in a gust of passion she left me, and in a resolution confirmed by a thousand curses not to close her eyes till they had seen my ruin. Exquisite woman! But what the devil! Does she think thou hast no more sense than to get an heir upon her body to disinherit thyself? Or, as I take it, this settlement upon you is, with a proviso, that your uncle have no children. It is so. Well, the service you are to do me will be a pleasure to yourself. I must get you to engage my lady pliant all this evening, that my pious aunt may not work her to her interest, and if you chance to secure her to yourself, you may incline her to mine. She's handsome and knows it, is very silly, and thinks she has sense, and has an old fond husband. I confess a very fair foundation for a lover to build upon. For my Lord Froth, he and his wife will be sufficiently taken up with admiring one another, and brisk gallantry, as they call it. I'll observe my uncle myself, and Jack Maskwell has promised me to watch my aunt narrowly, and give me notice upon any suspicion. As for Sir Paul, my wise father-in-law, that is to be, my dear Cynthia has such a share in his fatherly fondness, he would scarce make her a moment uneasy to have her happy hereafter. So you have manned your works. But I wish you may not have the weakest guard where the enemy is strongest. Maskwell, you mean? Prithee, why should you suspect him? Faith, I cannot help it. You know I never liked him. I am a little superstitious in physiognomy. He has obligations of gratitude to bind him to me. His dependence upon my uncle is through my means. Upon your aunt, you mean? My aunt? I'm mistaken if there be not a familiarity between them you do not suspect, notwithstanding her passion for you. Pooh, pooh, nothing in the world but his design to do me service, and he endeavours to be well in her esteem, that he may be able to effect it. Well, I shall be glad to be mistaken, but your aunt's aversion and her revenge cannot be any way so effectually shown as in bringing forth a child to disinherit you. She is handsome and cunning and naturally wanton. Maskwell is flesh and blood at best, and opportunities between them are frequent. His affection to you, you have confessed, is grounded upon his interest that you have transplanted. And should it take root in my lady, I don't see what you can expect from the fruit. I confess the consequence is visible, were your suspicions just. But, see... The company is broke up. Let's meet them. Scene 4. To them. Lord Touchwood, Lord Froth, Sir Paul Pliant, and Brisk. Out upon it, nephew. Leave your father-in-law and me to maintain our ground against young people. I beg your lordship's pardon. We were just returning. Were you, son? Gad's bud, much better as it is. Good, strange. I swear I'm almost tipsy. The other bottle would have been too powerful for me. As sure as can be, it would. We wanted your company, but Mr. Brisk, where is he? I swear and vow he's a most facetious person and the best company. And my Lord Froth. Your lordship is so merry a man. <laughs> oh, foy, Sir Paul, what do you mean? Merry, oh, barbarous, I'd as leave you called me a fool. Nay, I protest and vow now tis true. When Mr. Brisk jokes, 
Your lordship's laugh does so become you. <laughs> Ridiculous. Sir Paul, you're strangely mistaken. I find champagne is powerful. I assure you, Sir Paul, I laugh at nobody's jest but my own, or a lady's. I assure you, Sir Paul. How? How, my lord? What, affront my wit? <laughs> Let me perish. Do I never say anything worthy to be laughed at? Oh, foy, don't misapprehend me. I don't say so, for I often smile at your conceptions. But there is nothing more unbecoming a man of quality than to laugh. Tis such a vulgar expression of the passion. Everybody can laugh. Then especially to laugh at the jest of an inferior person, or when anybody else of the same quality does not laugh with one. Ridiculous! to be pleased with what pleases the crowd. Now when I laugh, I always laugh alone. I suppose that's because you laugh at your own jests, egad. Ha, ha, ha. He, he, I swear, though, your raillery provokes me to a smile. Aye, my lord, it's a sign I hit you in the teeth if you show em. He, 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 I swear that's so very pretty. I can't forbear. I find a quibble bears more sway in your lordship's face than a jest. Sir Paul, if you please, we'll retire to the ladies and drink a dish of tea to settle our heads. With all my heart. Mr. Brisk, you'll come to us, or call me when you joke. I'll be ready to laugh incontinently. Scene 5 Melifont, careless, Lord Froth, brisk. But does your lordship never see comedies? Oh, yes, sometimes. But I never laugh. No? Oh, no. Never laugh indeed, sir. No? Why, what do you go there for? To distinguish myself from the commonality and mortify the poets. The fellows grow so conceited when any of their foolish wit prevails upon the side-boxes. I swear, he he he, I have often constrained my inclinations to laugh, he he he, to avoid giving them encouragement. You are cruel to yourself, my lord, as well as malicious to them. I confess I did myself some violence at first, but now I think I have conquered it. Let me perish, my lord, but there is something very peculiar in the humour. Tis true it makes against wit, and I'm sorry for some friends of mine that write. But, cad, I love to be malicious. Nay, deuce take me, there's wit in it too, and wit must be foiled by wit. Cut a diamond with a diamond, no other way, gad. I thought you would not be long before you found out the wit. Wit? In what? Where the devil's the wit in not laughing when a man has a mind to it? Oh, Lord, why can't you find it out? Why, there tis in the not laughing. Don't you apprehend me? My Lord, careless is a very honest fellow, but harky, you understand me. Somewhat heavy, a little shallow or so. Well, I'll tell you now. Suppose now you come up to me. Nay, nay, prithee, careless, be instructed. Suppose, as I was saying, you come up to me, holding your sides and laughing as you would. Well, I look grave and ask the cause of this immoderate mirth. You laugh on still and are not able to tell me. Still I look grave, not so much a smile. Smile, no. What the devil should you smile at when you suppose I can't tell you? Pshaw, pshaw, prithee, don't interrupt me. But I tell you, you shall tell me at last, but it shall be a great while first. Well, but prithee, don't let it be a great while, because I long to have it over. Well, then, you tell me some good jest or some very witty thing, laughing all the while as if you were ready to die, and I hear it and look thus. Would you not be disappointed? 
No, for if it were a witty thing, I should not expect you to understand it. Oh, foy, Mr. Careless, all the world allows Mr. Brisk to have wit. My wife says he has a great deal. I hope you think her a judge. Pooh, my lord, his voice goes for nothing. I can't tell how to make him apprehend. Take it the other way. I suppose I say a witty thing to you. Then I shall be disappointed indeed. Let him alone, Brisk. He is obstinately bent not to be instructed. I'm sorry for him. The deuce take me. Shall we go to the ladies, my lord? With all my heart. Methinks we are a solitude without em. Or what say you to another bottle of champagne? Oh, for the universe, not a drop more, I beseech you. Oh, intemperate, I have a flushing in my face already. Takes out a pocket glass and looks in it. Let me see, let me see, my lord. I broke my glass that was in the lid of my snuff box. <laughs> Deuce take me, I have encouraged a pimple here, too. Takes the glass and looks. Then you must mortify him with a patch. My wife shall supply you. Come, gentlemen, allons. Here is company coming. Scene six. Lady Touchwood and Vaskwell. I'll hear no more. You are false and ungrateful. Come, I know you false. I have been frail, I confess, madam, for your ladyship's service. That I should trust a man whom I had known betray his friend. What friend have I betrayed? Or to whom? Your fond friend, Melifont, and to me. Can you deny it? I do not. Have you not wronged my lord, who has been a father to you in your wants, and given you being? Have you not wronged him in the highest manner, in his bed? With your ladyship's help, and for your service, as I told you before? I can't deny that neither. Any more, madam? More, audacious villain! Oh, what's more is most my shame! Have you not dishonoured me? No, that I deny, for I never told in all my life. So that accusation's answered. On to the next. Death do you dally with my passion, insolent devil. But have a care, provoke me not, for by the eternal fire you shall not scape my vengeance. Calm villain. How unconcerned he stands, confessing treachery and ingratitude. Is there a vice more black? Oh, I have excuses thousands for my faults. Fire in my temper, passions in my soul, apt to every provocation, oppressed at once with love and with despair. But a sedate, a thinking villain, whose black blood runs temperately bad, what excuse can clear? Will you be in temper, madam? I would not talk, not to be heard. I have been. She walks about disordered. A very great rogue for your sake, and you reproach me with it. I am ready to be a rogue still, to do you service, and you are flinging conscience and honour in my face to rebate my inclinations. How am I to behave myself? You know I am your creature, my life and fortune in your power. To disoblige you brings me certain ruin. Allow it I would betray you? I would not be a traitor to myself. I don't pretend to honesty, because you know I am a rascal. But I would convince you from the necessity of my being firm to you. Necessity, impudence. Can no gratitude incline you, no obligations touch you? Have not my fortune and my person been subjected to your pleasure? 
were you not in the nature of a servant and have i not in effect made you lord of all of me and of my lord where is that humble love the languishing that adoration which once was paid me and everlastingly engaged fixed rooted in my heart whence nothing can remove em yet you yet what yet nay misconceive me not madam when i say i've had a generous and a faithful passion which you have never favoured but through revenge and policy ha look you madam we are alone pray contain yourself and hear me you know you loved your nephew when i first sighed for you i quickly found it an argument that i loved for with that art you veiled your passion twas imperceptible to all the jealous eyes this discovery made me bold i confess it for by it i thought you in my power your nephew's scorn of you added to my hopes i watched the occasion and took you just repulsed by him warm at once with love and indignation your disposition my arguments and happy opportunity accomplished my design i pressed the yielding moment and was blessed how i have loved you since words have not shown then how should words express well mollifying devil and have i not met your love with forward fire your zeal i grant was ardent but misplaced there was revenge in view that woman's idol had defiled the temple of the god and love was made a mock worship a son and heir would have edged young mellifont upon the brink of ruin and left him none but you to catch at for prevention again provoke me do you wind me like a larum only to rouse my own stilled soul for your diversion confusion nay madam i'm gone if you relapse what needs this i say nothing but what you yourself in open hours of love have told me why should you deny it nay how can you is not all this present heat owing to the same fire do you not love him still how have i this day offended you but in not breaking off his match with cynthia which ere to-morrow shall be done had you but patience how what said you masquell another caprice to unwind my temper by heaven no i am your slave the slave of all your pleasures and will not rest till i have given you peace would you suffer me oh masquell in vain i do disguise me from thee thou knowest me knowest the very inmost windings and recesses of my soul o oh, mellifont i burn married to-morrow despair strikes me yet my soul knows i hate him too let him but once be mine and next immediate ruin seize him compose yourself you shall possess and ruin him too will that please you how how thou dear thou precious villain how you have already been tampering with my lady pliant i have she is ready for any impression i think fit she must be thoroughly persuaded that mellifont loves her she is so credulous that way naturally and likes him so well that she will believe it faster than i can persuade her but i don't see what you can propose from such a trifling design for her first conversing with mellifont will convince her of the contrary i know it 
I don't depend upon it. But it will prepare something else, and gain us leisure to lay a stronger plot. If I gain a little time, I shall not want contrivance. One minute gives invention to destroy, what to rebuild will a whole age employ. End of Act One Act Two of The Double Dealer by William Congreve This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, Lady Froth and Cynthia. Indeed, madam, is it possible your ladyship could have been so much in love? I could not sleep. I did not sleep one wink for three weeks together. Prodigious! I wonder want of sleep and so much love and so much wit as your ladyship has did not turn your brain. Oh, my dear Cynthia, you must not rally your friend. But really, as you say, I wonder too. But then I had a way. For between you and I, I had whimsies and vapours. But I gave them vent. How, pray, madam? Oh, I writ. Writ abundantly. Do you never write? Write what? Songs, elegies, satires, encomiums, panegyrics, lampoons, plays, or heroic poems? Oh, Lord, not I, madam. I'm content to be a courteous reader. Oh, inconsistent. In love and not right. If my lord and I had been both of your temper, we had never come together. Oh, bless me. What a sad thing that would have been if my lord and I should never have met. Then neither my lord nor you would have ever met with your match on my conscience. Of my conscience no more we should, thou sayest right. For sure my lord Froth is as fine a gentleman and as much a man of quality. Ah, nothing at all of the common air. I think I may say he wants nothing but a blue ribbon and a star to make him shine. The very phosphorus of our hemisphere. Do you understand those two hard words? If you don't, I'll explain them to you. Yes, yes, madam, I'm not so ignorant. Aside. At least I won't own it to be troubled with your instructions. Nay, I beg your pardon, but being derived from the Greek, I thought you might have escaped the etymology. But I'm the more amazed to find you a woman of letters and not right. Bless me, how can Melophon believe you love him? My faith, madam, he that won't take my word shall never have it under my hand. I vow Melophon's a pretty gentleman, but methinks he wants a manner. A manner? What's that, madam? Some distinguishing quality. As, for example, the bel air or brillant of Mr. Brisk. The solemnity yet complaisance of my lord, or something of his own that should look a little je ne sais quoi-ish. He is too much a mediocrity in my mind. He does not indeed affect either pertness or formality, for which I like him. Here he comes. And my lord with him. Pray, observe the difference. Scene two. To them, Lord Froth, Melifont, and Brisk. Cynthia, aside. Impertinent creature, I could almost be angry with her now. My lord, I have been telling Cynthia how much I have been in love with you. I swear I have. I'm not ashamed to own it now. Ah, it makes my heart leap. I vow I sigh when I think on it. My dear lord. <laughs> Do you remember, my lord? Squeezes him by the hand, looks kindly on him, sighs, and then laughs out. <sighs> Pleasant creature. Perfectly well. Ah, uh, that look. Aye, there it is. Who could resist? Twas so my heart was made a captive first. And ever since tas been in love with happy slavery. Oh, that tongue, that dear deceitful tongue, that charming softness in your mien and your expression, and then your bow. Good my lord, bow as you did when I gave you my picture. Here, suppose this my picture. Gives him a pocket glass. Pray mind, my lord. Ah, he bows charmingly. 
He bows profoundly low, then kisses the glass. Nay, my lord, you shan't kiss it so much. I shall grow jealous, I vow now. I saw myself there, and kissed it for your sake. Ah, gallantry to the last degree. Mr. Brisky, or a judge, was ever anything so well-bred as my lord? Never anything but your ladyship. Let me perish. Oh, prettily turned again. Let me die, but you have a great deal of wit. Mr. Mellifont, don't you think Mr. Brisk has a world of wit? Oh, yes, madam. Oh, dear, madam. An infinite deal. Oh, heavens, madam. More wit than anybody. I'm everlastingly your humble servant, deuce take me, madam. Don't you think us a happy couple? I vow, my lord, I think you the happiest couple in the world, for you're not only happy in one another and when you are together, but happy in yourselves and by yourselves. I hope Meliphant will make a good husband, too. Tis my interest to believe he will, my lord. Do you think he'll love you as well as I do my wife? I'm afraid not. I believe he'll love me better. Heavens, that can never be. But why do you think so? Because he has not so much reason to be fond of himself. Oh, your humble servant for that, dear madam. Well, Mellifont, you'll be a happy creature. Aye, my lord, I shall have the same reason for my happiness that your lordship has. I shall think myself happy. Ah, uh, that's all. Risk to Lady Froth. Your ladyship is in the right, but, uh, egad, I'm wholly turned into satire. I confess I write but seldom, but when I do, keen I am, egad. But my lord was telling me, your ladyship has made an essay toward an heroic poem. Did my lord tell you? Yes, I vow. And the subject is my lord's love to me. And what do you think I call it? I dare swear you won't guess. The syllabub. <laughs> because my lord's title's froth, he can. <laughs> Deuce take me. Very apropos and surprising. <laughs> he I, is it not? And then I call my lord Spumoso. And myself, what do you think I call myself? Lactilla, maybe. Uh, he can, I cannot tell. Biddy, that's all. Just my own name. Biddy! Egad, very pretty. A deuce take me if your ladyship is not the art of surprising the most naturally in the world. I hope you'll make me happy in communicating the poem. Oh, you must be my confidant. I must ask your advice. I'm your humble servant. <laughs> Let me perish. I presume your ladyship has read a bossu? Oh, yes. And Racine, and Dossier upon Aristotle and Horace. My lord, you must not be jealous. I'm communicating all to Mr. Brisk. No, no, I'll allow Mr. Brisk. Have you nothing about you to show him, my dear? Yes, I believe I have. Mr. Brisk, come. Will you go into the next room? And there I'll show you what I have. I'll walk a turn in the garden and come to you. Scene 3. Melifont, Cynthia. You're thoughtful, Cynthia. I'm thinking, though marriage makes man and wife one flesh, it leaves them still two fools, and they become more conspicuous by setting off one another. That's only when two fools meet, and their follies are opposed. Nay, I have known two wits meet, and by the opposition of their wit render themselves as ridiculous as fools. Tis an odd game we're going to play at. What think you of drawing stakes and giving over in time? No, Hank, that's not endeavouring to win because it's possible we may lose, since we have shuffled and cut. Let's even turn up Trump now. Then I find it's like cards. If either of us have a good hand, it is an accident of fortune. No, marriage is rather like a game of bowls. Fortune indeed makes the match, and the two nearest, and sometimes the two farthest, are together. But the game depends entirely upon judgment. Still, it is a game, and consequently one of us must be a loser. Not at all. Only a friendly trial of skill, and the winnings to be laid out in an entertainment. What's here? The music? Oh, my lord has promised the company a new song. We'll get him to give it us, by the way. 
Musicians crossing the stage. Pray, let us have the favour of you to practice the song before the company hear it. Song. Cynthia frowns when e'er I woo her, yet she's vexed if I give over. Much she fears I should undo her, but much more to lose her lover. Thus in doubting she refuses, and not winning thus she loses. Prithee, Cynthia, look behind you. Age and wrinkles will o'ertake you. Then too late desire will find you, when the power must forsake you. Think, oh, think, of oh, the sad condition to be past yet wish fruition. You shall have my thanks below. To the musicians, they go out. Scene four. To them, Sir Paul Pliant and Lady Pliant. Gad's bud, I am provoked into a fermentation, as my Lady Froth says. Was ever the like read of in story? Sir Paul, have patience. Let me alone to rattle him up. Pray, your ladyship. Give me leave to be angry. I'll rattle him up, I warrant you. I'll firk him with a centiorare. You firk him. I'll firk him myself. Pray, Sir Paul, hold you contented. Bless me, what makes my father in such a passion? I never saw him thus before. Hold yourself contented, my lady pliant. I find passion coming upon me by inflation and I cannot submit as formerly. Therefore, give way. How now? Will you be pleased to retire and... No, Mary, will I not be pleased? I am pleased to be angry. That's my pleasure at this time. What can this mean? Ah, oh, gad's my life, the man's distracted. Why, how now? Who are you? What am I? Slidikins, can't I govern you? What did I marry you for? Am I not to be absolute and uncontrollable? Is it fit a woman of my spirit and conduct should be contradicted in a matter of this concern? It concerns me, and only me. Besides, I'm not to be governed at all times. When I am in tranquillity, my lady pliant shall command Sir Paul. But when I am provoked to fury, I cannot incorporate with patience and reason. As soon may tigers match with tigers, lambs with lambs, and every creature couple with its foe, as the poet says. He's hot-headed still. Tis in vain to talk to you. But remember, I have a curtain lecture for you, you disobedient, headstrong brute. No. "'Tis because I won't be headstrong, because I won't be a brute, and have my head fortified, that I am thus exasperated. But I will protect my honour, and yonder is the violator of my fame. "'Tis my honour that is concerned, and the violation was intended to me. <laughs> Your honour, you have none but what is in my keeping.' and I can dispose of it when I please. Therefore, don't provoke me. Hmm, gads, bud, she says true. Well, my lady, march on. I will fight under you, then. I am convinced, as far as passion will permit. Lady Pliant and Sir Paul come up to Mellifont. Inhuman and treacherous. Thou serpent and first tempter of womankind. Bless me, sir, madam, what mean you? Thy, thy, come away, thy. Touch him not. Come hither, girl, go not near him. There's nothing but deceit about him. 
snakes are in his peruke, and the crocodile of Nilus is in his belly. He will eat thee up alive. Dishonorable, impudent creature. For heaven's sake, madam, to whom do you direct this language? Oh, have I behaved myself with all the decorum and nicety befitting the person of Sir Paul's wife? Have I preserved my honor as it were in a snow-house for these three years past? Have I been white and unsullied, even by Sir Paul himself? Nay, she has been an invincible wife, even to me. That's the truth, aunt. Have I, I say, preserved myself like a fair sheet of paper for you to make a blot upon? And she shall make a simile with any woman in England. I am amazed. I know not what to say. Do you think my daughter, this pretty creature, Gad's bud, she's a wife for a cherubim, do you think her fit for nothing but to be a stocking horse, to stand before you while you take aim at my wife? Gad's bud, I was never angry before in my life, and I'll never be appeased again. Melifont aside. Hell and damnation. This is my aunt. Such malice can be engendered nowhere else. Sir Paul, take Cynthia from his sight. Leave me to strike him with the remorse of his intended crime. Pray, sir, stay, hear him. I dare affirm he's innocent. Innocent? Why, harky, come hither, thy... Harky, I had it from his aunt, my sister Touchwood. Gads, but he does not care a farthing for anything of thee but thy portion. Why, he's in love with my wife. He would have tantalized thee and made a cuckold of thy poor father, and that would certainly have broke my heart. I'm sure, if ever I should have horns, they would kill me. They would never come kindly. I should die of them like a child that was cutting his teeth. I should indeed. Thy, therefore, come away, but providence has prevented all. Therefore, come away when I bid you. I must obey. Scene five. Lady Pliant, Melifont. Oh, such a thing! The impiety of it startles me. To wrong so good, so fair a creature, and one that loves you tenderly. "'Tis a barbarity of barbarities, and nothing could be guilty of it. "'But the greatest villain imagination can form, I grant it, "'and the next to the villainy of such a fact "'is the villainy of aspersing me with a guilt. "'How? Which way was I to wrong her? "'For yet I understand you not.' "'Why, gets my life, cousin Melfond. "'You cannot be so peremptory as to deny it "'when I tax you with it to your face.' For now Sir Paul's gone. You are quorum nobus. By heaven, I love her more than life, or... <laughs> fiddle, fiddle, don't tell me of this and that and everything in the world, but give me mathematical demonstration. Answer me directly. Oh, but I have not patience. Oh, the impiety of it, as I was saying, and the unparalleled wickedness... Oh, merciful father, how could you think to reverse nature so, to make the daughter the means of procuring the mother? The daughter to procure the mother? I, for though I am not Cynthia's own mother, I am her father's wife, and that's near enough to make it incest. Melifont aside. Incest? Oh, my precious aunt! And the devil in conjunction. Oh, reflect upon the horror of that, and then the guilt of deceiving everybody, oh, marrying the daughter only to make a cuckold of the father, and then seducing me, debauching my purity, and perverting me from the road of virtue in which I have trod thus long, and never made one trip, not one faux pas. Oh, consider it! 
what would you have to answer for if you should provoke me to frailty alas humanity is feeble heaven knows very feeble and unable to support itself where am i is it day and am i awake madam and nobody knows how circumstances may happen together to my thinking now i could resist the strongest temptation but yet i know tis impossible for me to know whether i could or not there's no certainty in the things of this life madam pray give me leave to ask you one question oh lord ask me the question i'll swear i refuse it i'll swear i'll deny it therefore don't ask me nay you shan't ask me i swear i'll deny it oh gemini you have brought all the blood into my face i warrant i am as red as a turkey cock oh fie cousin malfont nay madam hear me i mean hear you no no i'll deny you first and hear you afterwards for one does not know how one's mind may change upon hearing hearing is one of the senses and all the senses are fallible i won't trust my honour i assure you my honour is infallible and uncomeatable for heaven's sake madam oh name it no more bless me how can you talk of heaven and have so much wickedness in your heart <sighs> maybe you don't think it a sin they say some of you gentlemen don't think it a sin maybe it is no sin to them that don't think it so indeed if i did not think it a sin but still my honour if it were no sin but then to marry my daughter for the conveniency of frequent opportunities oh i'll never consent to that as sure as can be i'll break the match death and amazement madam upon my knees nay nay rise up come you shall see my good nature i know love is powerful and nobody can help his passion tis not your fault nor i swear it is not mine how can i help it if i have charms and how can you help it if you are made a captive i swear it is pity it should be a fault but my honour well but your honour too but the sin well but the necessity oh lord here's somebody coming i dare not stay well you must consider of your crime and strive as much as can be against it strive be sure but don't be melancholic don't despair but never think that i'll grant you anything oh lord no but be sure you lay aside all thoughts of the marriage for though i know you don't love cynthia only as a blind for your passion to me yet it will make me jealous oh lord what did i say jealous no no i can't be jealous for i must not love you therefore don't hope but don't despair neither oh they're coming i must fly scene six Melifont alone after a pause so then spite of my care and foresight i am caught caught in my security yet this was but a shallow artifice unworthy of my machiavellian art there must be more behind this is but the first flash the priming of her engine destruction follows hard if not most presently prevented scene seven to him maskwell maskwell welcome thy presence is a view of land appearing to my shipwrecked hopes the witch has raised the storm and her ministers have done their work you see the vessels are parted i know it i met sir paul towing away cynthia come trouble not your head i'll join you together ere to-morrow morning 
or drown between you in the attempt. There is comfort in a hand stretched out to one that's sinking, so ne'er so far off. No sinking, nor no danger. Come, cheer up. Why, you don't know that while I plead for you, your aunt has given me a retaining fee. Nay, I am your greatest enemy, and she does but journey work under me. Ha! How's this? What do you think of my being employed in the execution of all her plots? Ha! 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 By heaven it's true! I have undertaken to break the match. I have undertaken to make your uncle disinherit you, to get you turned out of doors, and to... Ha! 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 I can't tell you for laughing. Oh, she has opened her heart to me. I am to turn you a grazing and to ha, 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 marry Cynthia myself. There's a plot for you. Ha! Oh, see, I see my rising sun. Light breaks through clouds upon me, and I shall live and die. Oh, my Maskwell, how shall I thank thee or praise thee? Thou hast outwitted woman. But tell me, how couldst thou thus get into her confidence? Ha! How! But was it her contrivance to persuade my lady pliant to this extravagant belief? It was, and to tell you the truth, I encouraged it for your diversion. Though it made you a little uneasy for the present, yet the reflection of it must needs be entertaining. I warrant she was very violent at first. Ha! <laughs> I a very fury, but I was most afraid of her violence at last. If you had not come as you did, I don't know what she might have attempted. <laughs> I know her temper. Well, you must know then that all my contrivances were but bubbles, till at last I pretended to have been long secretly in love with Cynthia. That did my business, that convinced your aunt I might be trusted, since it was as much my interest as hers to break the match. Then she thought my jealousy might qualify me to assist her in her revenge, and in short, in that belief, told me the secrets of her heart. At length we made this agreement, if I accomplish her designs, as I told you before, she has engaged to put Cynthia with all her fortune into my power. She is most gracious in her favour. Well, and dear Jack, how hast thou contrived? I would not have you stay to hear it now, for I don't know but she may come this way. I am to meet her anon. After that, I'll tell you the whole matter. Be here in this gallery an hour hence. By that time, I imagine, our consultation may be over. I will. Till then, success attend thee. Scene 8. Maskwell alone. Till then, success will attend me, for when I meet you, I meet the only obstacle to my fortune. Cynthia, let thy beauty gild my crimes, and whatsoever I commit of treachery or deceit shall be imputed to me as a merit. Treachery? What treachery? Love cancels all the bonds of friendship and sets men right upon their first foundations. Duty to kings, piety to parents, Gratitude to benefactors and fidelity to friends are different and particular ties. But the name of rival cuts them all asunder and is a general acquittance. Rival is equal and love, like death, a universal leveller of mankind. Ha! But is there not such a thing as honesty? Yes, and whoever has it about him bears an enemy in his breast. 
for your honest man as i take it is that nice scrupulous conscientious person who will cheat nobody but himself such another coxcomb as your wise man who is too hard for all the world and will be made a fool of by nobody but himself <laughs> well for wisdom and honesty give me cunning and hypocrisy oh tis such a pleasure to angle for fair-faced fools then that hungry gudgeon credulity will bite at anything why let me see i have the same face the same words and accents when i speak what i do think and when i speak what i do not think the very same and dear dissimulation is the only art not to be known from nature why will mankind be fools and be deceived and why are friends and lovers oaths believed when each who searches strictly his own mind may so much fraud and power of baseness find end of act two act three of the double dealer by william congreve this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, Lord Touchwood and Lady Touchwood. My lord, can you blame my brother Pliant if he refuse his daughter upon this provocation? The contract's void by this unheard-of impiety. I don't believe it true. He has better principles. Ah, tis nonsense. Come, come. I know my lady plant has a large eye, and would center everything in her own circle. Tis not the first time she has mistaken respect for love, and made Sir Paul jealous of the civility of an undesigning person, the better to beseek his security in her unfeigned pleasures. You censor hardly, my lord. My sister's honour is very well known. Yes, I believe I know some that have been familiarly acquainted with it. This is a little trick wrought by some pitiful contriver, envious of my nephew's merit. Nay, my lord, it may be so, and I hope it will be found so. But that will require some time, for in such a case as this demonstration is necessary. There should have been demonstration to the contrary, too, before it had been believed. So I suppose there was. How? Where? When? That I can't tell. Nay, I don't say there was. I am willing to believe as favourably of my nephew as I can. Lord Touchwood, half aside. I don't know that. How? Don't you believe that, say you, my lord? No, I don't say so. I confess I'm troubled to find you so cold in his defence. His defence? Bless me, would you have me defend an ill thing? You believe it, then? I don't know. I am very unwilling to speak my thoughts in anything that may be to my cousin's disadvantage. Besides, I find, my lord, you are prepared to receive an ill impression from any opinion of mine which is not consenting with your own. But, since I am like to be suspected in the end, and it is a pain any longer to dissemble, I own it to you. In short, I do believe it, nay, and can believe anything worse if it were laid to his charge. Don't ask me my reasons, my lord, for they are not fit to be told you lord touchwood aside i am amazed there must be something more than ordinary in this not fit to be told me madam you can have no interest wherein i am not concerned and consequently the same reason ought to be convincing to me which create your satisfaction or disquiet but those which cause my disquiet i am willing to have removed from your hearing good my lord don't press me 
Don't oblige me to press you. Whatever it was, tis past, and that is better to be unknown which cannot be prevented. Therefore let me beg you to rest satisfied. When you have told me, I will. You won't. By my life, dear, I will. What if you can't? How? Then I must know, nay, I will. No more trifling. I charge you tell me. By all our mutual peace to come upon your duty. Nay, my lord, you need say no more to make me lay my heart before you. But don't be thus transported. Compose yourself. It is not of concern to make you lose one minute's temper. Tis not indeed, my dear. Nay, by this kiss you shan't be angry. Oh, Lord, I wish I had not told you anything. Indeed, my Lord, you have frighted me. Nay, look pleased, I'll tell you. Well, well. Nay, but will you be calm? Indeed, it's nothing but... But what? But will you promise me not to be angry? Nay, you must not to be angry with Melifont. I dare swear he's sorry, and were it to do again, would not... Sorry for what? Death you rack me with delay. Nay, no great matter, only... Well, I have your promise. For why nothing, only your nephew had a mind to amuse himself sometimes with a little gallantry towards me. Nay, I can't think he meant anything seriously, but methought it looked oddly. Confusion at hell, what do I hear? Or, oh, maybe, he thought he was not enough akin to me, upon your account, and had a mind to create a nearer relation on his own. A lover, you know, my lord. <laughs> well, but that's all. Now you have it. Well, remember your promise, my lord, and don't take any notice of it to him. No, 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 damnation. Nay, I swear you must not. A little harmless mirth only misplaced, that's all. But if it were more, tis over now, and all's well. For my part, I have forgot it, and so has he, I hope. For I have not heard anything from him these two days. These two days? Is it so fresh? A natural villain? Death, I'll have him stripped and turned naked out of my doors this moment, and let him rot and perish, incestuous brute. Oh, for heaven's sake, my lord, you'll ruin me if you take such public notice of it. It will be a town talk. Consider your own and my honour. Nay, I told you you would not be satisfied when you knew it. Before I've done, I will be satisfied. Ungrateful monster! How long? Lord, I don't know. I wish my lips had grown together when I told you. Almost a twelvemonth. Nay, I won't tell you any more till you are yourself. Pray, my lord, don't let the company see you in this disorder. Yet, I confess, I can't blame you, for I think I was never so surprised in my life. Who would have thought my nephew could have so misconstrued my kindness? But will you go into your closet and recover your temper? I'll make an excuse of sudden business to the company and come to you. Pray, good, dear my lord, let me beg you do now. I'll come immediately and tell you all. Will you, my lord? I will. I am mute with wonder. Well, but go now. Here's somebody coming. Well, I go. You won't stay? For I would hear more of this. I follow instantly, so. Scene two. Lady Touchwood, Maskwell. This was a masterpiece and did not need my help, though I stood ready for a cue to come in and confirm all had there been occasion. Have you seen Melifont? I have, and am to meet him here about this time. How does he bear his disappointment? 
secure in my assistance he seemed not much affected but rather laughed at the shallow artifice which so little time must of necessity discover yet he is apprehensive of some farther design of yours and has engaged me to watch you i believe he will hardly be able to prevent your plot yet i would have you use caution and expedition expedition indeed for all we do must be performed in the remaining part of this evening and before the company break up lest my lord should cool and have an opportunity to talk with him privately my lord must not see him again by no means therefore you must aggravate my lord's displeasure to a degree that will admit of no conference with him what think you of mentioning me how to my lord as having been privy to mellifont's design upon you but still using my utmost endeavours to dissuade him though my friendship and love to him has made me conceal it yet you may say i threatened the next time he attempted anything of that kind to discover it to my lord to what end is this it will confirm my lord's opinion of my honour and honesty and create in him a new confidence in me which should this design miscarry will be necessary to the forming another plot that i have in my head aside to cheat you as well as the rest i'll do it i'll tell him you hindered him once from forcing me excellent your ladyship has a most improving fancy you had best go to my lord keep him as long as you can in his closet and i doubt not that you will mould him to what you please your guests are so engaged in their own follies and intrigues they'll miss neither of you when shall we meet at eight this evening in my chamber there rejoice at our success and toy away an hour in mirth i will not fail scene three maskwell alone i know what she means by toying away an hour well enough pox i have lost all appetite to her yet she's a fine woman and i loved her once but i don't know since i have been in a great measure kept by her the case is altered what was once pleasure is become my duty and i have as little stomach to her now as if i were her husband should she smoke my design upon cynthia i were in a fine pickle she has a damned penetrating head and knows how to interpret a coldness the right way therefore i must dissemble ardour and ecstasy that's resolved how easily and pleasantly is that dissemble before fruition pox on it that a man can't drink without quenching his thirst ha yonder comes mellifont thoughtful let me think meet her at eight hmm hmm by heaven i have it if i can speak to my lord before was it my brain or providence no matter which i will deceive em all and yet secure myself twas a lucky thought well this double dealing is a duel here he comes now for me maskwell pretending not to see him walks by him and speaks as it were to himself scene four to him mellifont musing mercy on us what will the wickedness of this world come to oh no jack 
What so full of contemplation that you run over? I am glad you're come, for I could not contain myself any longer, and was just going to give vent to a secret which nobody but you ought to drink down. Your aunt's just gone from hence. And having trusted thee with the secrets of her soul, thou art villainously bent to discover em all to me. <laughs> I am afraid my frailty leans that way, but I don't know whether I can, in honour, discover em all. All, all men. What? You may in honour betray her as far as she betrays herself. No tragical design upon my person, I hope. No, but it's a comical design upon mine. What dost thou mean? Listen and be dumb. We have been bargaining about the rate of your ruin. Like any two guardians to an orphan heiress, well? And whereas pleasure is generally paid with mischief, what mischief I do is to be paid with pleasure. So when you've swallowed the potion, you sweeten your mouth with a plum. You are merry, sir, but I shall probe your constitution. In short, the price of your banishment is to be paid with the person of... Of Cynthia and her fortune. Why, you forgot you told me this before. No, no. So far you are right and I am, as an earnest of that bargain, to have full and free possession of the person of your aunt. <coughs> Foe, you trifle. By this light I'm serious, all raillery apart. I knew twould stun you. This evening at eight she will receive me in her bedchamber. Hell and the devil, is she abandoned of all grace? Why, the woman is possessed. Well, will you go in my stead? By heaven, into a hot furnace sooner. No, you would not. It would not be so convenient as I can order matters. What do you mean? Mean? Not to disappoint the lady, I assure you. <laughs> How gravely he looks. Come, come, I won't perplex you. It is the only thing that Providence could have contrived to make me capable of serving you, either to my inclination or your own necessity? How, how, for heaven's sake, dear Marsquell? Why thus? I'll go according to appointment. You shall have notice at the critical minute to come and surprise your aunt and me together. Counterfeit a rage against me, and I'll make my escape through the private passage from her chamber, which I'll take care to leave open. Twill be hard if then you can't bring her to any conditions. For this discovery will disarm her of all defence, and leave her entirely at your mercy. Nay, she must ever after be in awe of you. Let me adore thee, my better genius. By heaven, I think it is not in the power of fate to disappoint my hopes. My hopes? My certainty. Well, I'll meet you here within a quarter of eight and give you notice. Good fortune ever go along with thee. Scene 5. Melophont, Careless. Melophont? Get out of the way. My lady Pliant's coming, and I shall never succeed while thou art in sight. Though she begins to tack about. But I may love a great while to no purpose. Why? What's the matter? She's convinced that I don't care for her. I can't get an answer from her that does not begin with her honour, or her virtue, her religion, or some such cant. Then she has told me the whole history of Sir Paul's nine years' courtship, how he has lain for whole nights together upon the stairs before a chamber door, and that the first favour he received from her was a piece of an old scarlet petticoat for a stomacher, which, since the day of his marriage, he has out of a piece of gallantry converted into a nightcap, and wears it still with much solemnity on his anniversary wedding night. That I have seen with the ceremony thereunto belonging, 
for on that night he creeps in at the bed's feet like a gold basser that has married a relation of the Grand Seigneur, and that night he has his arms at liberty. Did not she tell you at what a distance she keeps him? He has confessed to me that, but at some certain times, that is, I suppose, when she apprehends being with child, he never has the privilege of using the familiarity of a husband with a wife. He was once given to scrambling with his hands and sprawling in his sleep, and ever since she has him swaddled up in blankets and his hands and feet swathed down and so put to bed, and there he lies with a great beard like a Russian bear upon a drift of snow. You are very great with him. I wonder he never told you his grievances. He will, I warrant you. Excessively foolish. But that which gives me most hopes of her is her telling me of the many temptations she has resisted. Nay, then you have her, for a woman's bragging to a man that she has overcome temptations is an argument that they were weakly offered, and a challenge to him to engage her more irresistibly. It is only an enhancing of the price of the commodity by telling you how many customers have underbid her. Nay, I don't despair. But still she has a grudging to you. I talked to her the other night at my Lord Froth's masquerade, when I am satisfied she knew me, and I had no reason to complain of my reception. But I find women are not the same bare-faced and in masks, and a visor disguises their inclinations as much as their faces. "'Tis a mistake, for women may most properly be said to be unmasked when they wear visors, for that secures them from blushing and being out of countenance, and next to being in the dark or alone, they are most truly themselves in a visor mask. Here they come. I'll leave you. Ply her close, and by and by clap a billet doux into her hand. For a woman never thinks a man truly in love with her till he has been fool enough to think of her out of her sight, and to lose so much time as to write to her. Scene 6 Careless, Sir Paul, and Lady Pliant. Shan't we disturb your meditation, Mr. Careless? You would be private. You bring that along with you, Sir Paul, that shall be always welcome to my privacy. Oh, sweet sir, you load your humble servants, both me and my wife, with continual favours. Sir Paul, what a phrase was there! You will be making answers and taking that upon you which ought to lie upon me. That you should have so little breeding to think Mr. Careless did not apply himself to me. Pray, what have you to entertain anybody's privacy? I swear and declare in the face of the world, I am ready to blush for your ignorance. Sir Paul, aside to her. I acquiesce, my lady. But... Don't snub so loud. Mr. Careless, if a person that is wholly illiterate might be supposed to be capable of being qualified to make a suitable return to those obligations which you are pleased to confer upon one that is wholly incapable of being qualified in all those circumstances, I'm sure I should rather attempt it than anything in the world. Courtesies for I'm sure there's nothing in the world that I would rather. Courtesies. But I know Mr. Careless is so great a critic and so fine a gentleman that it is impossible for me. Oh, heavens, madam, you confound me. Gad's bud, she's a fine person. Oh, Lord, sir, pardon me. We women have not those advantages. I know my imperfections, but at the same time you must give me leave to declare in the face of the world that nobody is more sensible of favours and things. For with the reserve of my honour, I assure you, Mr. Careless, I don't know anything in the world I would refuse to a person so meritorious. You'll pardon my want of expression. Oh, your ladyship is abounding in all excellence, particularly that of phrase. 
you are so obliging sir your ladyship is so charming so now 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 my lady so well bred so surprising so well dressed so bonne mine so eloquent so unaffected so easy so free so particular so agreeable ah so so there oh lord i beseech you madam don't so gay so graceful so good teeth so fine shape so fine limbs so fine linen and i don't doubt but you have a very good skin sir for heaven's sake madam i'm quite out of countenance and my lady's quite out of breath or else you should hear gad's bud you may talk of my lady froth oh fie fie not to be named of a day my lady froth is very well in her accomplishments but it is when my lady Pline is not thought of if that can ever be oh you overcome me that is so excessive nay i swear and vow that was pretty oh sir paul you are the happiest man alive such a lady that is the envy of her own sex and the admiration of ours your humble servant i am i thank heaven in a fine way of living as i may say peacefully and happily and i think need not envy any of my neighbours blessed be providence ay truly mr careless my lady is a great blessing a fine discreet well-spoken woman as you shall see if it becomes me to say so and we live very comfortably together she is a little hasty sometimes and so am i but mine's soon over and then i'm so sorry oh mr careless if it were not for one thing scene seven careless sir paul lady pliant boy with a letter how often have you been told of that you jackanapes gad so gad's bud tim carry it to my lady you should have carried it to my lady first tis directed to your worship oh, well well my lady reads all letters first child do so no more do you hear tim no and please you scene eight careless sir paul lady pliant a humour of my wife's you know women have little fancies but as i was telling you mr careless if it were not for one thing i should think myself the happiest man in the world indeed that touches me near very near what can that be sir paul why i have i thank heaven a very plentiful fortune a good estate in the country some houses in town and some money a pretty tolerable personal estate and it is a great grief to me indeed it is mr careless that i have not a son to inherit this tis true i have a daughter and a fine dutiful child she is though i say it blessed be providence i may say for indeed mr careless i am mightily beholden to providence a poor unworthy sinner but if i had a son ah that's my affliction and my only affliction indeed i cannot refrain tears when it comes in my mind <laughs> cries why methinks that might be easily remedied my lady is a fine likely woman ah oh, 
a fine likely lady as you shall see in a summer's day indeed she is mr careless in all respects and i should not have taken you to have been so old alas that's not it mr careless oh that's not it no no you shoot wider the mark a mile indeed you do that's not it mr careless no no that's not it no what can be the matter then you'll scarcely believe me when i tell you my lady is so nice it's very strange but it's true too true she's so very nice that i don't believe she would touch a man for the world at least not above once a year i'm sure i have found it so and alas what's once a year to an old man who would do good in his generation indeed it's true mr careless it breaks my heart i am her husband as i may say though far unworthy of that honour yet i am her husband but alas a day i have no more familiarity with her person as to that matter than with my own mother uh, no indeed alas a day this is a lamentable story my lady must be told on t she must efface sir paul tis an injury to the world ah would to heaven you would mr careless you are mightily in her favour i warrant you what we must have a son some way or other indeed i should be mightily bound to you if you could bring it about mr careless here sir paul it's from your steward here's a return of six hundred pounds you may take fifty of it for the next half year gives him the letter scene nine to them lord froth cynthia how does my girl come hither to thy father poor lamb thou art melancholic heaven sir paul you amaze me of all the things in the world you are never pleased but when we are all upon the broad grin all laugh and no company ah uh, then tis such a sight to see some teeth sure you're a great admirer of my lady whiffler mr sneer and sir lawrence loud and that gang i vow and swear she's a very merry woman but i think she laughs a little too much merry oh lord what a character that is of a woman of quality you have been at my lady whiffler's upon her day madam yes my lord aside i must humour this fool well and how he what is your sense of the conversation oh most ridiculous a perpetual comfort of laughing without any harmony for sure my lord to laugh out of time is as disagreeable as to sing out of time or out of tune he 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 right and then my lady whiffler is so ready she always comes in three bars too soon and then what do they laugh at for you know laughing without a jest is an impertinence he as 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 dancing without a fiddle just e faith that was at my tongue's end but that cannot be properly said of them for i think they are all in good nature with the world and only laugh at one another and you must allow they all have jests in their person though they have none in their conversation true as i am a person of honour for heaven's sake let us sacrifice em to mirth a little enter boy and whispers sir paul gad so a wife a wife my lady pliant i have a word i'm busy sir paul i wonder at your impertinence sir paul harkye i'm reasoning the matter you know madam 
If your ladyship please, we'll discourse of this in the next room. Aha! Uh -huh. I wish you good success. I, I wish you good success. Boy, tell my lady when she has done, I would speak with her below. Scene 10. Cynthia, Lord Froth, Lady Froth, Brisk. Then you think that episode between Susan, the dairymaid, and our coachman is not amiss? You know, I may suppose the dairy in town as well as in the country. Incomparable, let me perish. Uh, but then, being an heroic poem, had you better not call him a charioteer? A charioteer sounds great. Besides, your ladyship's coachman having a red face and you comparing him to the sun. And you know the sun is called Heaven's Charioteer. Oh, infinitely better. I'm extremely beholden to you for the hint. Stay, we'll read over those half a score lines again. Pulls out a paper. Let me see here. You know what goes before. The comparison, you know. Reads. For as the sun shines every day, so of our coachman, I may say. I'm afraid that simile won't do in wet weather, because you say the sun shines every day. No, for the sun it won't. But it will do for the coachman, for you know there's most occasion for a coach in wet weather. Right, right, that saves all. Then I don't say the sun shines all the day, but that he peeps now and then. Yet he does shine all the day too, you know, though we don't see him. Right, but the vulgar will never comprehend that. Well, you shall hear. Let me see. Read. For as the sun shines every day, so of our coachman, I may say, he shows his drunken, fiery face, just as the sun does, more or less. That's right. All's well. All's well. More or less. Lady Froth reads. And when at night his labor's done, then too, like heaven's charioteer the sun, ay, charioteer does better, into the dairy he descends, and there his whipping and his driving ends. There he's secure from danger of a bilk, his fare is paid him, and he sets in milk. For Susan, you know, is Thetis, and so... Incomparable well and proper, <laughs> Gad. But I have one exception to make. Uh, don't you think bilk, I know it's good rhyme, but don't you think bilk and fare too like a hackney coachman? I swear and vow I'm afraid so. And yet our Jehu was a hackney coachman when my lord took him. Was he? Well, I'm answered if Jehu was a hackney coachman. You may put that in the marginal notes, though, to prevent criticism. Only uh, mark it with a small asterism and say, Jehu was formerly a hackney coachman. I will. You'd oblige me extremely to write notes to the whole poem. With all my heart and soul and proud of the vast honor, let me perish. He he he, my dear. Have you done... Won't you join with us? We were laughing at my Lady Whiffler and Mr. Sneer. Aye, my dear, were you? Oh, filthy Mr. Sneer. He's a nauseous figure, a most fulsomic fop. Phew. He spent two days together in going about Covent Garden to suit the lining of his coach with his complexion. Oh, silly. Yet his aunt is as fond of him as if she had brought the ape into the world herself. Who? My lady toothless? Oh, she's a mortifying spectacle. She's always chewing the cud like an old ewe. Fie, Mr. Brisk. Erin goes for her cough. I have seen her take him half-chewed out of her mouth to laugh and then put him in again. Faugh. Foe. Then she's always ready to laugh when Sneer offers to speak, and sits in expectation of his no jest with her gums bare and her mouth open. Like an oyster at low ebb, he <laughs> ha ha Cynthia aside. Well, I find there are no fools so inconsiderable in themselves, but they can render other people contemptible by exposing their infirmities. Then there's that t'other great strapping lady. I can't hit of her name. The old fat fool that paints so exorbitantly. Well, I know who you mean, but deuce take me. I can't hit of her name neither. A paints, do you say? Uh, well, she lays it on with a trowel. Then she has uh, 
great beard that bristles through it and makes her look as if she were plastered with lime and hair, let me perish. Oh, you made a song upon her, Mr. Brisk. He, he can't, so I did. My lord can sing it. Oh, good, my lord, let's hear it. "'Tis not a song, neither. It's a sort of an uh, epigram, or rather an uh, epigrammic sonnet. I don't know what to call it, but it's satire. Sing it, my lord. "'Ancient Phyllis has young graces. Tis a strange thing, but a true one. Shall I tell you how?' She herself makes her own faces, and each morning wears a new one. Where's the wonder now? Short, but there's salt in it. My way of writing, he gad. <laughs> Scene 11. To them, footman. How now? Your ladyship's chair is come. Is nurse and the child in it? Yes, madam. Oh, the dear creature. Let's go see it. I swear, my dear, you'll spoil that child with sending it to and fro again so often. This is the seventh time the chair has gone for her today. Oh, law, I swear it's but the sixth, and I haven't seen her these two hours. The poor creature. I swear, my lord, you don't love poor little Sappho. Come, my dear Cynthia, Mr. Brisk, we'll go see Sappho, though my lord won't. I'll wait upon your ladyship. Pray, madam, how old is Lady Sappho? Three quarters, but I swear she has a world of wit and can sing a tune already. My lord, won't you go? Won't you? What, not to see Saff? Pray, my lord, come see little Saff. I knew you could not stay. Scene 12. Cynthia alone. Tis not so hard to counterfeit joy in the depth of affliction as to dissemble mirth in a company of fools. Why should I call them fools? The world thinks better of them, for these have quality and education, wit and fine conversation, are received and admired by the world. If not, they like and admire themselves. And why is not that true wisdom? For tis happiness, and for I ought to know. For we have misapplied the name all this while, and mistaken the thing, since, if happiness and self-content is placed, the wise are wretched and fools only blessed. End of Act Three Act Four of The Double Dealer by William Congreve This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One, Melifont and Cynthia. I heard him loud as I came by the closet door, and my lady with him, but she seemed to moderate his passion. Ay, hell thank her, as gentle breezes moderate a fire, but I shall counterwork her spells, and ride the witch in her own bridle. It's impossible. She'll cast beyond you still. I'll lay my life. It will never be a match. What? Between you and me. Why so? My mind gives me it won't, because we are both willing. We each of us strive to reach the goal and hinder one another in the race. I swear it never does well when the parties are so agreed, for when people walk hand in hand, there's neither overtaking nor meeting. We hunt in couples, where we both pursue the same game but forget one another, and tis because we are so near that we don't think of coming together. Hmm. Gad, I believe there's something in it. Marriage is the game that we hunt, and while we think that we only have it in view, I don't see but we have it in our power. Within reach, for example, give me your hand. You have looked through the wrong end of the perspective all this while, for nothing has been between us but our fears. I don't know why we should not steal out of the house this very moment and marry one another, without consideration or the fear of repentance. Pox, O oh, fortune, portion, settlements, and jointures. Ay, ay, what have we to do with them? You know we marry for love. Love, love, downright, very villainous love. And he that can't live upon love deserves to die in a ditch. Here, then, I give you my promise, in spite of duty, any temptation of wealth, your inconstancy, or my own inclination to change. 
to run most willfully and unreasonably away with me this moment and be married. Hold, never to marry anybody else. That's but a kind of negative consent. Why, you won't balk the frolic? If you had not been so assured of your own conduct, I would not. But tis but reasonable that since I consent to like a man without the vile consideration of money, he should give me a very evident demonstration of his wit. Therefore let me see you undermine my lady Touchwood, as you boasted, and force her to give her consent, and then... I'll do it. And I'll do it. This very next ensuing hour of eight o'clock is the last minute of her reign, unless the devil assist her in propria persona. Well, if the devil should assist her and your plot miscarry... Aye, what am I to trust to then? Why, if you give me very clear demonstration that it was the devil, I'll allow for irresistible odds. But if I find it to be only chance, or destiny, or unlucky stars, or anything but the very devil, I'm inexorable. Only still I'll keep my word and live a maid for your sake. And you won't die one for your own, so still there's hope. Here's my mother-in-law and your friend Careless. I would not have him see us together yet. Scene 2 Careless and Lady Pliant I swear, Mr. Careless, you are very alluring, and say so many fine things, and nothing is so moving to me as a fine thing. Well, I must do you this justice and declare in the face of the world, never anybody gained so far upon me as yourself. With blushes, I must own it, you have shaken, as I may say, the very foundation of my honour. Well, sure, if I escape your importunities, I shall value myself as long as I live, I swear. And despise me. <sighs> the last of any man in the world by my purity. Now you make me swear. Oh, gratitude forbid that I should ever be wanting in a respectful acknowledgement of an entire resignation of all my best wishes for the person and parts of so accomplished a person whose merit challenges much more, I'm sure, than my illiterate praises can description. Ah, oh, heavens, madam, you ruin me with kindness. Your charming tongue pursues the victory of your eyes, while at your feet your poor adorer dies. Ah, oh, very fine. Ah, why are you so fair, so bewitching fair? Oh, let me grow to the ground here and feast upon that hand. Oh, let me press it to my heart, my trembling heart. The nimble movement shall instruct your pulse and teach it to alarm desire. Aside. Zooms, I'm almost at the end of my cant, if she does not yield quickly. Oh, that's so passionate and fine, I cannot hear. I am not safe if I stay, and I must leave you. And must you leave me? Rather, let me languish out of wretched life, and breathe my soul beneath your feet. Aside. I must say the same thing over again, and can't help it. Oh, I swear I'm ready to languish, too. Oh, my honour, whither is it going? I protest you have given me the palpitation of the heart. Can you be so cruel? Oh, rise, I beseech you. Say no more till you rise. Why did you kneel so long? I swear I was so transported I did not see it. Well, to show you how far you have gained upon me, I assure you, if Sir Paul should die, of all mankind there's none I'd sooner make my second choice. Oh, heaven! I can't outlive this night without your favour. I feel my spirits faint. A general dampness overspreads my face. A cold, deadly dew already vents through all my pores, and will will tomorrow wash me forever from your sight and drown me in my tomb. Oh, you have conquered, sweet, melting, moving, sir. You have conquered. What heart of marble can refrain to weep and yield to such sad sayings? Oh. I thank heaven. They are the saddest that I ever said. Ah. Aside. I shall never contain laughter. Oh, 
i yield myself all up to your uncontrollable embraces say thou dear dying man when where and how oh there's sir paul it's life yonder sir paul but if he were not come i'm so transported i cannot speak this note will inform you gives her a note scene three lady pliant sir paul cynthia thou art my tender lambkin and shall do what thou wilt but endeavour to forget this mellifont i would obey you to my power sir but if i have not him i have sworn never to marry never to marry heavens forbid must i neither have sons nor grandsons must the family of the pliants be utterly extinct for want of issue male oh impiety but did you swear did that sweet creature swear oh how durst you swear without my consent ah gads bud who am i Pray don't be angry, sir, when I swore I had your consent, and therefore I swore. Why, then, the revoking my consent does not null, or make of none affect your oath. So you may unswear it again. The law will allow it. Ay, but my conscience never will. Gad, bud, no matter for that. Conscience and law never go together. You must not expect that. Ay, but, Sir Paul, I conceive if she has sworn, ye mark me, if she has once sworn, it is most unchristian, inhuman, and obscene that she should break it. Aside. I'll make up the match again, because Mr. Careless said it would oblige him. Does your ladyship conceive so? Why, I was of that opinion once, too. Nay, if your ladyship conceives so, I'm of that opinion again. But I can neither find my lord, nor my lady, to know what they intend. I'm satisfied that my cousin Melfond has been much wronged. Cynthia, aside. I'm amazed to find her of our side, for I'm sure she loved him. I know my lady Touchwood has no kindness for him, and besides, I have been informed by Mr. Careless that Melfond had never anything more than a profound respect, that he has owned himself to be my admirer, tis true, but he was never so presumptuous to entertain any dishonourable notions of things, so that if this be made plain, I don't see how my daughter can in conscience or honour or anything in the world. Indeed, if this be made plain, as my lady, your mother, says, child. Plain? I was informed of it by Mr. Careless. And I assure you, Mr. Careless is a person that has a most extraordinary respect and honour for you, Sir Paul. Cynthia, aside. And for your ladyship, too, I believe, or else you had not changed sides so soon. Now I begin to find it. I am much obliged to Mr. Careless, really. He is a person that I have a great value for. Not only for that, but because he has a great veneration for your ladyship. Alas, no indeed, Sir Paul. Tis upon your account. No, I protest and vow I have no title to his esteem but in having the honour to appertain in some measure to your ladyship, that's all. Oh, Lord, now I swear and declare it shan't be so. You're too modest, Sir Paul. It becomes me, when there is any comparison made between. Oh, fie, fie, Sir Paul, you'll put me out of countenance. You're very obedient and affectionate wife, that's all and highly honoured in that title gads bud i am transported give me leave to kiss your ladyship's hand cynthia aside that my poor father should be so very silly 
my lip indeed sir paul i swear you shall he kisses her and bows very low i humbly thank your ladyship i don't know whether i fly on ground or walk in air gad's bud she was never thus before well i must own myself the most beholden to mr careless as sure as can be this is all his doing something that he has said well tis a rare thing to have an ingenious friend well your ladyship is of opinion that the match may go forward by all means mr careless has satisfied me of the matter well why then lamb you may keep your oath but have a care about making rash vows come hither to me and kiss papa i swear and declare i am in such a twitter to read mr careless's letter that i can't forbear any longer but though i may read all letters first by prerogative yet i'll be sure to be unsuspected this time sir paul did your ladyship call nay not to interrupt you my dear only lend me your letter which you had from your steward to-day i would look upon the account again and maybe increase your allowance there it is madam do you want a pen and ink bows and gives the letter no no nothing else i thank you sir paul aside so now i can read my own letter under the cover of his he and wilt thou bring a grandson at nine months end he a brave chopping boy i'll settle a thousand pound a year upon the rogue as soon as ever he looks me in the face i will gad's bud i'm overjoyed to think i have any of my family that will bring children into the world for i would fain have some resemblance of myself in my posterity he thy can't you contrive that affair girl do gads bud think on thy old father eh make the young rogue as like as you can i'm glad to see you so merry sir merry gads bud i'm serious i'll give thee five hundred pounds for every inch of him that resembles me ay this eye this left eye a thousand pounds for this left eye this has done execution in its time girl why thou hast my leer hussy just thy father's leer let it be transmitted to the young rogue by the help of imagination why tis the mark of our family thy our house is distinguished by a languishing eye as the house of austria is by a thick lip ah oh, when i was of your age hussy i would have held fifty to one i could have drawn my own picture gads but i could have done not so much as you neither but nay don't blush i don't blush sir for i vow i don't understand pshaw pshaw you fib you baggage you do understand and you shall understand come don't be so nice gads bud don't learn after your mother-in-law my lady here mary heaven forbid that you should follow her example that would spoil all indeed bless us if you should take a vagary and make a rash resolution on your wedding night to die a maid as she did all were ruined all my hopes lost my heart would break and my estate would be left to the wide world he i hope you are a better christian than to think of living a nun he answer me i'm all obedient sir to your commands lady pliant having read the letter oh dear mr careless i swear he writes charmingly and he looks charmingly 
and he has charmed me as much as i have charmed him and so i'll tell him in the wardrobe when tis dark oh criminy i hope sir paul has not seen both letters puts the wrong letter hastily up and gives him her own <laughs> sir paul here's your letter to-morrow morning i'll settle accounts to your advantage scene four to them brisk sir paul gadsbud you're an uncivil person let me tell you and all that and i did not think it had been in you oh law what's the matter now i hope you are not angry mr brisk deuce take me i believe you intend to marry your daughter yourself you're always brooding over her like an old hen as if she were not well hatched <laughs> gad he good strange mr brisk is such a merry facetious person <laughs> no no i have done with her i have done with her now the fiddles have stayed this hour in the hall and my lord froth wants a partner we can never begin without her go go child go get you gone and dance and be merry i'll come and look at you by and by where's my son Melifont? i'll send him to them i know where he is sir paul will you send careless into the hall if you meet him i will i will i'll go and look for him on purpose scene five brisk alone so now they are all gone and i have an opportunity to practice <laughs> ah my dear lady froth she's a most engaging creature if she were not so fond of that damned coxcombly lord of hers and yet i am forced to allow him wit too to keep in with him no matter she's a woman of parts and he can parts will carry her she said she would follow me into the gallery now to make my approaches <laughs> oh madam bows pox on it why should i disparage my parts by thinking what to say none but dull rogues think witty men like rich fellows are always ready for all expenses while your blockheads like poor needy scoundrels are forced to examine their stock and forecast the charges of the day here she comes i'll seem not to see her and try to win her with a new airy invention of my own Ahem. scene six to him lady froth brisk sings walking about i'm sick with love <laughs> prithee come cure me i'm sick with <laughs> oh ye powers oh my lady froth my lady froth my lady froth hi ho break heart gods i thank you stands musing with his arms across oh heavens mr brisk what's the matter my lady froth your ladyship's most humble servant uh, the matter madam uh, nothing madam nothing at all he gad i was fallen into the most agreeable amusement in the whole province of contemplation uh, that's all aside i'll seem to conceal my passion and that will look like respect bless me why did you call out upon me so loud oh lord i madam uh, i beseech your ladyship uh, when just now as i came in bless me why don't you know it uh, not i let me perish but did i strange i confess your ladyship was in my thoughts and i was in a sort of dream that did in a manner represent a very pleasing object to my imagination but uh, but did i indeed to see how love and murder will out but did i really name my lady froth three times aloud as i love letters but did you talk of love oh parnassus who would have thought mr brisk could have been in love <laughs> oh heavens i thought you could have no mistress but the nine muses no more i have egad for i adore em all in your ladyship oh, let me perish i don't know whether to be splenetic or airy upon it the deuce take me if i could tell whether i am glad or sorry that your ladyship has made the discovery oh be merry by all means prince volsius in love <laughs> oh barbarous to turn me into ridicule 
it. Ha, 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 ha. The deuce take me. I can't help laughing myself. Ha, ha, ha. Yet, by heavens, I have a violent passion for your ladyship. Seriously. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously? Ha, ha, ha. Gad, I have for all I laugh. <laughs> what do you think I laugh at? <laughs> me, Gad. Ha, ha, ha. No, the deuce take me if I don't laugh at myself. For hang me if I have not a violent passion for Mr. Brisk. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously. <laughs> That's well enough. Let me perish. Ha ha ha. Oh, miraculous. What a happy discovery. Ah, oh, my dear, charming Lady Froth. Oh, my adored Mr. Brisk. Embrace. Scene 7. To them, Lord Froth. The company are all ready. How now? Brisk, softly to Lady Froth. Zunes, madam, there's my lord. Take no notice, but observe me. Now cast off and meet me at the lower end of the room, and then join hands again. I could teach my lord this dance purely, but I vow, Mr. Brisk, I can't tell how to come so near any other man. Oh, here is my lord. Now you shall see me do it with him. They pretend to practice part of a country dance. Lord Froth, aside. Oh, I see there's no harm yet, but I don't like this familiarity. Shall you and I do our close dance to show Mr. Brisk? No, my dear. Do it with him. I'll do it with him, my lord, when you are out of the way. Brisk, aside. That's good, Gad. That's good. Deuce take me, I can hardly hold laughing in his face. Any other time, my dear, or we'll dance it below. With all my heart. Uh, come, my lord, I'll wait on you. Uh, to her. My charming, witty angel. We shall have whispering time enough, you know, since we are partners. Scene 8. Lady Pliant and Careless. Oh, Mr. Careless, Mr. Careless, I'm ruined. I'm undone. What's the matter, madam? Oh, the unluckiest accident. I'm afraid I shan't live to tell it you. Heaven forbid. What is it? I'm in such a fright. The strangest quandary and premier. I'm all over in a universal agitation. I dare swear every circumstance of me trembles. Oh, your letter, your letter. By an unfortunate mistake, I have given Sir Paul your letter instead of his own. That was unlucky. <gasps> Yonder he comes reading of it. Oh, for heaven's sake, step in here and advise me quickly before he sees. Scene 9. Sir Paul with the letter. Oh, Providence. What a conspiracy have I discovered. But let me see to make an end on it. Reads. Hmm. After supper in the wardrobe by the gallery. If Sir Paul should surprise us, I have a commission from him to treat with you about the very matter of fact. Matter of fact? Very pretty. It seems that I am conducting to my own cockledom. Why, this is the very traitorous position of taking up arms by my authority, against my person. Well, let me see. Till then I languish in expectation of my adored charmer, dying Ned careless. Gad's bud, for that were a matter of fact too. Die and be damned for a Judas Maccabeus and an Iscariot both. Oh, friendship, what art thou but a name? Henceforth let no man make a friend that would not be a cuckold, for whosoever he receives into his bosom will find the way to his bed, and there return his caresses with interest to his wife. Have I for this been pinioned, night after night for three years past? Have I been swathed in blankets till I have been even deprived of motion? 
have I approached the marriage bed with reverence as to a sacred shrine, and denied myself the enjoyment of lawful domestic pleasures to preserve its purity? And must I now find it polluted by foreign iniquity? Oh, my lady pliant, you were chaste as ice, but you are melted now and false as water. But Providence has been constant to me in discovering this conspiracy. Still, I am beholden to Providence. If it were not for Providence, sure, poor Sir Paul, thy heart would break. Scene 10. To him, Lady Pliant. So, sir, I see you have read the letter. Well, now, Sir Paul, what do you think of your friend Careless? Has he been treacherous, or did you give his insolence a license to make trial of your wife's suspected virtue? Do you see here? Snatches the letter as in anger. Look, read it. Gets my life, if I thought it were so, I would this moment renounce all communication with you. Ungrateful monster! He, is it so? Aye, I see it. A plot upon my honour. You guilty cheeks confess it. Oh, where shall wronged virtue fly for reparation? I'll be divorced this instant. Glad bud. What shall I say? This is the strangest surprise. Why, I don't know anything at all. Nor I don't know whether there be anything at all in the world or no. I thought I should try you, false man. I that never dissembled in my life. Yet, to make trial of you, pretended to like that monster of iniquity, careless, and found out that contrivance to let you see this letter, which now I find was of your own indicting. I do, heathen, I do. <sighs> see my face no more. I'll be divorced presently. Oh, strange. What will become of me? I'm so amazed and so overjoyed, so afraid and so sorry. But did you give me this letter on purpose, he? Did you? Did I? Do you doubt me, Turk? Saracen? I have a cousin that's a proctor in the commons. I'll go to him instantly. Hold, stay. I beseech your ladyship. I'm so overjoyed to stay. I'll confess all. What will you confess, Jew? Why, now, as I hope to be saved, I had no hand in this letter. Nay, hear me, I beseech your ladyship. The devil take me now if he did not go beyond my commission. If I desired him to do any more than speak a good word only just for me, gads, but only for poor Sir Paul, I'm an Anabaptist, or a Jew, or, or what you please to call me. Why, is not here matter of fact? Aye, but by your own virtue and continency, this matter of fact is all his own doing. I confess I had a great desire to have some honours conferred upon me, which lie all in your ladyship's breast, and he being a well-spoken man, I desired him to intercede for me. Did you so? Presumption! Oh, he comes! that Tarquin comes. Oh, I cannot bear his sight. Scene 11. Careless Sir Paul. Sir Paul, I'm glad I've met with you. Can I have said all I could but can't prevail? Then my friendship to you has carried me a little farther in this matter. Indeed. Aside. Well, sir, I'll dissemble with him a little. Why... Faith, I have in my time known honest gentlemen abused by a pretended coyness in their wives, and I had a mind to try my lady's virtue. And when I could not prevail for you, Cat, I pretended to be in love myself, but all in vain she would not hear a word upon that subject. Then I wrote a letter to her. I don't know what effects that will have, but I'll be sure to tell you when I do, though by this light I believe her virtue is impregnable. 
Oh, Providence, Providence! What discoveries are here made? Why, this is better and more miraculous than the rest. What do you mean? I can't tell you. I'm so overjoyed. Come along with me to my lady. I can't contain myself. Come, my dear friend. Careless aside. So, 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 this difficulty's over. Scene 12. Melifont, Maskwell, from different doors. Maskwell, I have been looking for you. Tis within a quarter of eight. My lady is just gone into my lord's closet. You had best steal into her chamber before she comes and lie concealed there. Otherwise she may lock the door when we are together, and you not easily get in to surprise us. He? You say true. You had best make haste, for after she has made some apology to the company for her own and my lord's absence all this while, she'll retire to her chamber instantly. I go at this moment. Now, fortune, I defy thee. Scene 13. Maskwell alone. I confess you may be allowed to be secure in your own opinion. The appearance is very fair, but I have an after-game to play that shall turn the tables, and here comes the man that I must manage. Scene 14. To him, Lord Touchwood. Maskwell, you are the man I wish to meet. I am happy to be in the way of your lordship's commands. I have always found you prudent and careful in anything that has concerned me or my family. I were a villain else. I am bound by duty and gratitude and my own inclination to be ever your lordship's servant. Enough. You are my friend. I know it. Yet there has been a thing in your knowledge which has concerned me nearly that you have concealed from me. My lord! Nay, I excuse your friendship to my unnatural nephew thus far, but I know you have been privy to his impious designs upon my wife. This evening she has told me all. Her good nature concealed it as long as it was possible, but he perseveres so in villainy that she has told me even you were weary of dissuading him, though you have once actually hindered him from forcing her. I am sorry, my lord, but I can't make an answer. This is an occasion in which I would not willing be silent. I know you would excuse him, and I know as well that you can't. Indeed, I was in hopes it had been a youthful heat, that might have soon boiled over, but... Say on. I have nothing more to say, my lord, but to express my concern, for I think his frenzy increases daily. How? Give me proof of it, ocular proof, that I may justify my dealing with him to the world and share my fortunes. Oh, my lord, consider, that is hard. Besides, time may work upon him. Then for me to do it, I have professed an everlasting friendship to him. He is your friend? And what am I? I am answered. Fear not his displeasure. I will put you out of his and fortune's power, and for that thou art scrupulously honest, I will secure thy fidelity to him, and give my honour never to own any discovery that you shall make me. Can you give me a demonstrative proof? Speak. I wish I could not. To be plain, my lord, I intended this evening to have tried all arguments to dissuade him from a design which I suspect, and if I had not succeeded, to have informed your lordship of what I knew. I thank you. What is the villain's purpose? He has owned nothing to me of late, and what I mean now is only a bare suspicion of my own. 
if your lordship will meet me a quarter of an hour hence there in that lobby by my lady's bedchamber i shall be able to tell you more i will my duty to your lordship makes me do a severe piece of justice i will be secret and reward your honesty beyond your hopes scene fifteen scene opening shows lady touchwood's chamber Melifont solus pray heaven my aunt keep touch with her assignation oh that her lord were but sweating behind this hanging with the expectation of what i shall see hist she comes little does she think what a mine is just ready to spring under her feet but to my post goes behind the hangings scene sixteen lady touchwood tis eight o'clock methinks i should have found him here who does not prevent the hour of love outstays the time for to be dully punctual is too slow i was accusing you of neglect scene seventeen lady touchwood maskwell melifont absconding i confess you do reproach me when i see you here before me but tis fit i should be still behind and still to be more and more indebted to your goodness you can excuse a fault too well not to have been to blame a ready answer shows you were prepared guilt is ever at a loss and confusion waits upon it when innocence and bold truth are always ready for expression not in love words are the weak support of cold indifference love has no language to be heard excess of joy has made me stupid thus may my lips be ever closed kisses her and thus oh who would not lose his speech upon condition to have joys above it hold let me lock the door first goes to the door maskwell aside that i believed twas well i left the private passage open so that's safe and so may all your pleasures be and secret as this kiss Melifont leaps out and may all treachery be thus discovered ah! villain offers to draw nay then there's but one way runs out scene eighteen lady touchwood Melifont. say you so were you provided for an escape hold madam you have no more holes to your burrow or you'll stand between you and this sally port thunder strike thee dead for this deceit immediate lightning blast thee me and the whole world oh i could rack myself play the vulture to my own heart and gnaw it piecemeal for not boding to me this misfortune be patient be damned consider i have you on the hook you will but flounder yourself aweary and be nevertheless my prisoner i'll hold my breath and die but i'll be free oh madam have a care of dying unprepared i doubt you have some unrepented sins that may hang heavy and retard your flight oh what shall i do say whither shall i turn has hell no remedy none hell has served you even as heaven has done left you to yourself you're in a kind of erasmus paradise yet if you please you may make it a purgatory and with a little penance and my absolution all this may turn to good account lady touchwood aside hold in my passion and fall fall a little thou swelling heart let me have some intermission of this rage and one minute's coolness to dissemble <laughs> you have been to blame i like those tears and hope they are of the purest kind penitential tears oh the scene was shifted quick before me i had not time to think i was surprised to see a monster in the glass 
and now i find tis myself can you have mercy to forgive the faults i have imagined but never put in practice oh consider consider how fatal you have been to me you have already killed the quiet of this life the love of you was the first wandering fire that e'er misled my steps and while i had only that in view i was betrayed into unthought-of ways of ruin may i believe this true oh be not cruelly incredulous how can you doubt these streaming eyes keep the severest eye o'er all my future conduct and if i once relapse let me not hope forgiveness twill ever be in your power to ruin me my lord shall sign to your desires i will myself create your happiness and cynthia shall be this night your bride but do conceal my failings and forgive upon such terms i will be ever yours in every honest way scene nineteen maskwell softly introduces lord touchwood and retires i have kept my word he's here but i must not be seen scene twenty lady touchwood lord touchwood mellifont ah hell and amazement she's in tears lady touchwood kneeling eternal blessings thank you aside ha my lord listening oh fortune has o'erpaid me all all all's my own nay i beseech you rise never never i'll grow to the ground be buried quick beneath it ere i'll be consenting to so damned a sin as incest unnatural incest Cah. oh cruel man will you not let me go i'll forgive all that's past oh heaven you will not ravish me damnation monster dog your life shall answer this draws and runs at mellifont is held by lady touchwood oh heavens my lord hold hold for heaven's sake confusion my uncle oh the damned sorceress moderate your rage good my lord he's mad alas he's mad indeed he is my lord and knows not what he does see how wild he looks by heaven twere senseless not to be mad and see such witchcraft my lord you hear him he talks idly hence from my sight thou living infamy to my name when next i see that face i'll write villain in it with my sword's point now by my soul i will not go till i have made known my wrongs nay till i have made known yours which if possible are greater though she has all the host of hell her servants alas he raves talks very poetry for heaven's sake away my lord he'll either tempt you to extravagance or commit some himself death and furies will you not hear me as she is going she turns back and smiles at him why by heaven she laughs grins points to your back she forks out cuckoldom with her fingers and you're running horn mad after your fortune i fear he's mad indeed let's send maskwell to him send him to her come come good my lord my heart aches so i shall faint if i stay scene twenty one mellifont alone oh i could curse my stars fate and chance all causes and accidents of fortune in this life but to what purpose yet steth for a man to have the fruit of all his industry grow full and ripe ready to drop into his mouth and just when he holds out his hand to gather it to have a sudden whirlwind come tear up tree and all and bear away the very root and foundation of his hopes what temper can contain they talk of sending maskwell to me i never had more need of him but what can he do imagination cannot form a fairer and more plausible design than this of his which has miscarried oh my precious aunt i shall never thrive without i deal with the devil or another woman women like flames have a destroying power 
ne'er to be quenched till they themselves devour. End of Act 4 Act 5 of The Double Dealer by William Congreve This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One, Lady Touchwood and Maskwell. Was not lucky? Lucky? Fortune is your own, and tis her interest so to be. By heaven I believe you can control her power, and she fears it though chance brought my lord twas your own art that turned it to advantage tis true it might have been my ruin but yonder's my lord i believe he's coming to find you i'll not be seen scene two maskwell alone so i durst not own my introducing my lord though it succeeded well for her for she would have suspected a design which i should have been puzzled to excuse my lord is thoughtful i'll be so too yet he shall know my thoughts or think he does scene three to him lord touchwood what have i done oh talking to himself twas honest and shall i be rewarded for it no twas honest therefore i shan't nay rather therefore i ought not for it rewards itself lord touchwood aside unequal virtue but should it be known then i have lost a friend he was an ill man and i have gained for half myself i lent him and that i have recalled so i have served myself and what is yet better i have served a worthy lord to whom i owe myself lord touchwood aside excellent man yet i am wretched oh there is a secret burns within this breast which should it once blaze forth would ruin all consume my honest character and brand me with the name of villain ha <laughs> why do i love yet heaven and my waking conscience are my witnesses i never gave one working thought of vent which might discover that i loved nor ever must no let it prey upon my heart for i would rather die than seem once barely seem dishonest oh should it once be known i love fair cynthia all this that i have done would look like rival's malice false friendship to my lord and base self-interest let me perish first and from this hour avoid all sight and speech and if i can all thought of that pernicious beauty ha but what is my distraction doing? I am wildly talking to myself, and some ill chance might have directed malicious ears this way. Seems to start, seeing my lord. Start not. Let guilty and dishonest souls start at the revelation of their thoughts. But be thou fixed as in thy virtue. I am confounded, and beg your lordship's pardon for those free discourses which I have had with myself. Come, I beg your pardon that I overheard you, and yet it shall not need. Honest Maskwell, thy and my good genius led me hither, mine in that I have discovered so much manly virtue, thine in that thou shalt have due reward for all thy worth. Give me thy hand. My nephew is the alone remaining branch of all our ancient family. Him I thus blow away and constitute thee in his room to be my heir. Now heaven forbid! No more, I have resolved. The writings are already drawn, and wanted nothing but to be signed. 
and have his name inserted. Yours will fill the blank as well. I have no reply. Let me command this time, for tis the last in which I will assume authority. Hereafter you shall rule where I have power. I humbly would petition. Is it for yourself? Maskwell pauses. I'll hear of not for anybody else. Then witness heaven for me. This wealth and honour was not of my seeking, nor would I build my fortune on another's ruin. I had but one desire. Thou shalt enjoy it. If all I'm worth in wealth or interest can purchase Cynthia, she is thine. I'm sure Sir Paul's consent will follow fortune. I'll quickly show him which way that is going. You oppress me with bounty. My gratitude is weak and shrinks beneath the weight and cannot rise to thank you. What, enjoy, my love? Forgive the transports of a blessing so unexpected, so unhoped for, so unthought of. I will confirm it and rejoice with thee. Scene 4. Maskwell Alone This is prosperous indeed. Why let him find me out a villain, settled in possession of a fair estate and full fruition of my love? I'll bear the railings of a losing gamester. But should he find me out before, tis dangerous to delay. Let me think. Should my lordship proceed to treat openly of my marriage with Cynthia, all must be discovered, and Melophont can be no longer blinded. It must not be. Nay, should my lady know it, I then were fine work indeed. Her fury would spare nothing, though she involved herself in ruin. No, it must be by stratagem. I must deceive Melophont once more, and get my lord to consent to my private management. He comes opportunely. Nor will I, in my old way, discover the whole and real truth of the matter to him, that he may not suspect one word on it. No mask like open truth to cover lies, as to go naked is the best disguise. Scene 5. To him, Melophont. Oh, Maskwell, what hopes! I am confounded in a maze of thoughts, each leading into one another, and all ending in perplexity. My uncle will not see nor hear me. No matter, sir, don't trouble your head. All's in my power. How? For heaven's sake? Little do you think that your aunt has kept her word. How the devil she wrought my lord into this dotage I know not. But he's gone to Sir Paul about my marriage with Cynthia, and has appointed me his heir. The devil he has! What's to be done? I have it. It must be by stratagem, for it's in vain to make application to him. I think I have that in my head that cannot fail. Where's Cynthia? In the garden. Let us go and consult her. My life for yours I cheat my lord scene six lord touchwood lady touchwood maskwell your heir and marry cynthia i cannot do too much for so much merit but this is a thing of too great moment to be so suddenly resolved why cynthia why must he be married is there not reward enough in raising his low fortune but he must mix his blood with mine and wed my niece how know you that my brother will consent, or she? Nay, he himself perhaps may have affections otherwhere. No, I am convinced he loves her. Masquell loves Cynthia? Impossible. I tell you, he confessed it to me. Lady Touchwood, aside. Confusion? How's this? His humility long stifled in passion and his love and Melophant would have made him still conceal it. But by encouragement I wrung the secret from him, 
and know he's no way to be rewarded but in her. I'll defer my farther proceedings in it till you have considered it. But remember how we are both indebted to him. Scene 7. Lady Touchwood Alone Both indebted to him. Yes, we are both indebted to him if you knew all. Villain! Oh, I am wild with this surprise of treachery. It is impossible. It cannot be. He loves Cynthia. What, have I been bored to his designs? His property only a baiting place? Now I see what made him false to Merfont. Shame and destruction. I cannot bear it. Oh, what woman can bear to be a property? To be kindled to a flame only to light him to another's arms? Oh, that I were fire indeed that I might burn the vile traitor. What shall I do? How shall I think? I cannot think. All my designs are lost, my love unsated, my revenge unfinished, and fresh cause of fury from unthought of plagues. Scene 8. To her, Sir Paul. Madam sister, my lady sister, did you see my lady my wife? Oh, torture! Gads, but I can't find her high nor low. Where can she be, think you? Where she's serving you, as all your sex ought to be served, making you a beast. Don't you know you're a fool, brother? A fool? <laughs> you're merry. No, no, not I. I know no such matter. Why, then, you don't know half your happiness. That's a jest with all my heart, faith, and troth. But hark ye, my lord told me something of a revolution of things. I don't know what to make on it. Gads, but I must consult my wife. He talks of disinheriting his nephew, and I don't know what. Look, you, sister, I must know what my girl has to trust to, or not a syllable of a wedding, Gads, bud, to show you that I am not a fool. Hear me. Consent to the breaking off this marriage, and the promoting any other without consulting me, and I'll renounce all blood, all relation and concern with you for ever. Nay, I'll be your enemy, and pursue you to destruction. I'll tear your eyes out, and tread you under my feet. Why, what's the matter now? Good Lord, what's all this for? Boo, here's a joke indeed. Why, where's my wife? With careless, in the close arbour. He may want you by this time as much as you want her. Oh, if she be with Mr. Careless, tis well enough. Fool, sot, insensible ox! But remember what I said to you, or you had better eat your own horns by this light you had. You're a passionate woman, Gadsbud. But to say truth... All our family are caloric. I'm the only peaceable person amongst them. Scene 9. Melifont, Maskwell, and Cynthia. I know no other way but this he has proposed, if you have love enough to run the venture. I don't know whether I have love enough, but I find I have obstinacy enough to pursue whatever I have once resolved, and a true female courage to oppose anything that resists my will, though to reason itself. That's right. Well, I'll secure the writings and run the hazard along with you. But how can the coach and six horses be got ready without suspicion? Leave it to my care. That shall be so far from being suspected that it shall be got ready by my lord's own order. How? Why, I intend to tell my lord the whole matter of our contrivance. That's my way. I don't understand you. Why, I'll tell my lord I laid this plot with you on purpose to betray you, and that which put me upon it was the finding it impossible to gain the lady any other way but in the hopes of her marrying you. So? So, why so, while you're busied in making yourself ready, I'll wheedle her into the coach 
and instead of you borrow my lord's chaplain and so run away with her myself oh i conceive you you'll tell him so tell him so i why you don't think i mean to do so no no <laughs> i dare swear thou wilt not therefore for our further security i would have you disguised like a parson that if my lord should have curiosity to peep he may not discover you in the coach but think the cheat is carried on as he would have it excellent maskwell thou wert certainly meant for a statesman or a jesuit but thou art too honest for one and too pious for the other well get yourself ready and meet me in half an hour yonder in my lady's dressing-room go by the back stairs and so we may slip down without being observed i'll send the chaplain to you with his robes i have made him my own and ordered him to meet us to-morrow morning at st albans there we will sum up this account to all our satisfactions should i begin to thank or praise thee i should waste the little time we have scene ten cynthia maskwell madam you will be ready i will be punctual to the minute going stay i have a doubt upon second thoughts we had better meet in the chaplain's chamber here the corner chamber at this end of the gallery there is a back way into it so that you need not come through this door and a pair of private stairs leading down to the stables it will be more convenient i am guided by you but Melifont will mistake no no i'll after him immediately and tell him i will not fail scene eleven maskwell alone why qui vult disipi disipiator tis no fault of mine i have told em in plain terms how easy tis for me to cheat em and if they will not hear the serpent's hiss they must be stung into experience and future caution now to prepare my lord to consent to this but first i must instruct my little levite there is no plot public or private that can expect to prosper without one of them has a finger in it he promised me to be within at this hour mr saygrace mr saygrace goes to the chamber door and knocks scene twelve maskwell saygrace saygrace looking out sweet sir i will but pen the last line of an acrostic and be with you in the twinkling of an ejaculation in the pronouncing of an amen or before you can nay good mr saygrace do not prolong the time by describing to me the shortness of your stay rather if you please defer the finishing of your wit and let us talk about our business it shall be tithes in your way saygrace enters you shall prevail i would break off in the middle of a sermon to do you a pleasure you could not do me a greater except the business in hand have you provided a habit for mellifont i have they are ready in my chamber together with a clean starched band and a cough good let them be carried to him have you stitched the gown sleeve that he may be puzzled and waste time in putting it on i have the gown will not be endued without perplexity meet me in half an hour here in your own chamber when cynthia comes let there be no light and do not speak that she may not distinguish you from mellifont i'll urge haste to excuse your silence you have no more commands none your text is short but pither 
and I will handle it with discretion. It will be the first you have so served. Scene 13. Lord Touchwood, Maskwell. Sure I was born to be controlled by those I should command. My very slaves will shortly give me rules how I shall govern them. I am concerned to see your lordship discomposed. You have seen my wife lately, or disobliged her? No, my lord. Aside. What can this mean? Then Meliphant has urged somebody to incense her. Something she has heard of you which carries her beyond the bounds of patience. Maskwell, aside. This I feared. Did not your lordship tell her of the honours you designed me? Yes. Tis that. You know my lady has a high spirit. She thinks I am unworthy. Unworthy. Tis an ignorant pride in her to think so. Honesty to me is true nobility. However, tis my will it shall be so, and that should be convincing to her as much as reason. By heaven, I'll not be wife-ridden. Were it possible, I should be done this night. Maskwell aside. By heaven, he meets my wishes. Few things are impossible to willing minds. Instruct me how this may be done. You shall see I want no inclination. I had laid a small design for tomorrow, as love will be inventing, which I thought to communicate to your lordship, but it may as well be done to-night. Ah, here's company. Uh, come this way and tell me. Scene 14. Careless and Cynthia. Is not that he now gone out with my lord? Yes. By heaven, there's treachery. The confusion that I saw your father in, my lady Touchwood's passion, with what imperfectly I overheard between my lord and her, confirm me in my fears. Where's Melifont? Here he comes. Scene 15. To them, Melifont. Did Maskwell tell you anything of the chaplain's chamber? No. My dear, will you get ready? The things are all in my chamber. I want nothing but the habit. You are betrayed. And Maskwell is the villain I always thought him. When you were gone, he said his mind was changed and bid me meet him in the chaplain's room, pretending immediately to follow you and give you notice. How? There's Sagrace tripping by with a bundle under his arm. It cannot be ignorant that Maskwell means to use his chamber. Let's follow and examine him. Tis loss of time. I cannot think him false. Scene 16. Cynthia, Lord Touchwood. My lord musing. He has quick invention, if this were suddenly designed. Yet he says he had prepared my chaplain already. How's this? Now I fear indeed. Cynthia here? Alone, fair cousin, and melancholy? Your lordship was thoughtful. My thoughts were on serious business, not worth your hearing. Mine were on treachery concerning you, and may be worth your hearing. <laughs> treachery concerning me? Pray, be plain. Hark, what noise! Maskwell, within. Will you not hear me? Lady Touchwood, within. No, monster, traitor, no! My lady and Maskwell, this may be lucky. My lord, let me entreat you stand behind this screen and listen. Perhaps this chance may give you proof of what you ne'er could have believed from my suspicions. Scene 17. Lady Touchwood with a dagger. Maskwell, Cynthia and Lord Touchwood abscond, listening. You want but leisure to invent fresh falsehood, and soothe me to a fond belief of all your fictions. But I will stab the lie that's forming in your heart, and see the sin in pity to your soul. Strike, then, since you will have it so. Ha! A steady villain to the last. Come, why do you dally with me thus? Thy stubborn temper shocks me, and you knew it would. This is cunning all, and not courage. No, I know thee well, but thou shalt miss thy aim. Ha! 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 
Do you mock my rage? Then this shall punish your fond, rash contempt. A cane smile! Goes to strike. And such a smile as speaks in ambiguity. Ten thousand meanings lurk in each corner of that various face. Oh, that they were written in thy heart, that I with this might lay thee open to my sight! But then twill be too late to know. Thou hast, thou hast found the only way to turn my rage. Too well thou knowest my jealous soul could never bear uncertainty. Speak then, and tell me. Yet you are silent. Oh, I am wildered in all passions. But thus my anger melts. <laughs> Here, take this poniard, for my very spirits faint, and I want strength to hold it. Thou hast disarmed my soul. Gives the dagger. Amazement shakes me. Where will this end? So, tis well. Let your wild fury have a vent, and when you have temper, tell me. Now, now, now I am calm and can hear you. Maskwell aside. Thanks, my invention, and now I have it for you. First tell me what urged you to this violence, for your passion broke in such imperfect terms, that yet I am to learn the cause. My lord himself surprised me with the news you were to marry Cynthia, that you had owned our love to him, and his indulgence would assist you to attain your ends. How, my lord? Pray, forbear all resentments for a while, and let us hear the rest. I grant you in appearance all is true. I seemed consenting to my lord, nay, transported with the blessing. But could you think that I, who had been happy in your loved embraces, could ever be fond of an inferior slavery? Ah, oh, poison to my ears. What do I hear? Nay, good my lord, forbear resentments, let us hear it out. Yes, I will contain, though I could burst. I, that had wantoned in the rich circle of your world of love, could be confined within the puny province of a girl? No, yet though I dote on each last favour more than all the rest, though I would give a limb, for every look you cheaply throw away on any object of your love, yet so far I prize your pleasures over my own, that all this seeming plot that I have laid has been to gratify your taste and cheat the world, to prove a faithful rogue to you. If this were true, but how can it be? I have so contrived that Melifont will presently, in the chaplain's habit, wait for Cynthia in your dressing-room. But I have put the change upon her, that she may be other where employed. Do you procure her nightgown, and with your hoods tied over your face, meet him in her stead? You may go privately by the back stairs, and unperceived there you may propose to reinstate him in his uncle's favour if he'll comply with your desires his case is desperate and i believe he'll yield to any conditions if not here take this you may employ it better than in the heart of one who is nothing when not yours gives the dagger thou canst deceive everybody Nay, thou hast deceived me, but tis as I would wish. Trusty villain, I could worship thee. No more, it wants but a few minutes of the time, and Melifont's love will carry him there before his hour. I go, I fly, incomparable Maskwell. Scene 18. Maskwell, Cynthia, Lord Touchwood. So this was a pinch indeed. My invention was upon the rack, and made discovery of her last plot. I hope Cynthia and my chaplain will be ready. 
I'll prepare for the expedition. Scene 19. Cynthia and Lord Touchwood. Now, my lord. Astonishment binds up my rage. Villainy upon villainy. Heavens, what a long track of dark deceit has this discovered. I am confounded when I look back and want a clue to guide me through the various mazes of unheard of treachery. My wife, damnation, my hell. My lord, have patience and be sensible how great our happiness is that this discovery was not made too late. I thank you, yet it may be still too late if we don't presently prevent the execution of their plots. Ah, I'll do it. Where's Melvant, my poor injured nephew? How shall I make him ample satisfaction? I dare answer for him. I do him fresh wrong to question his forgiveness, but I know him to be all goodness. Yet my wife, damn her, she'll think to meet him in the dressing room. Was it not so? and Maskwell will expect you in the chaplain's chamber. For once, I'll add my plot, too. Let us haste to find out, and inform my nephew, and do you quickly as you can bring all the company into this gallery. I'll expose the strumpet and the villain. Scene 20. Lord Froth and Sir Paul. By heaven, I have slept an age. Sir Paul, what o'clock is past eight on my conscience my lady's is the most inviting couch and a slumber there is the prettiest amusement but where's all the company the company gadsbud i don't know my lord but here's the strangest revolution all turned topsy-turvy as i hope for providence oh heavens what's the matter where's my wife all turned topsy-turvy as sure as a gun how do you mean my wife the strangest posture of affairs what's my wife no no i mean the family your lady's affairs may be in a very good posture. I saw her go into the garden with Mr. Brisk. How? Where? When? What to do? I suppose they have been laying their heads together. How? Nay, only about poetry, I suppose, my lord, uh, making couplets. Couplets? Ah, here they come. Scene 21. To them, Lady Froth Brisk. My lord, your humble servant, Sir Paul, yours, the finest knight. My dear, Mr. Brisk and I have been stargazing, I don't know how long. Does it not tire your ladyship? Are you not weary with looking up? Oh no, I love it violently. My dear, your melancholy no my dear i'm but just awake snuff some of my spirit of hartshorn i've some of my own thank you dear well i swear mr brisk you understood astronomy like an old egyptian not comparably to your ladyship you are the very cynthia of the skies and queen of stars that's because i have no light but what's by reflection from you who are the sun? Madam, you have eclipsed me quite. Let me perish. I can't answer that. No matter. Harky, shall you and I make an almanac together? With all my soul. Your ladyship has made me the man in it already. I'm so full of the wounds which you have given. Oh, finely taken. I swear now you are even with me. Oh, Parnassus, you have an infinite deal of wit. So he has, Gadsbud. And so has your ladyship. Scene 22. To them, Lady Pliant, Careless, Cynthia. You tell me most surprising things. Bless me, who would ever trust a man? Oh, my heart aches for fear they should be all deceitful alike. You need not fear, madam. 
you have charms to fix in constancy itself. Oh, dear. You make me blush. Come, my dear. Shall we take leave of my lord and lady? Go wait upon your lordship presently. Mr. Brisk, my coach shall set you down. A great shriek from the corner of the stage. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's, What's the, the matter? matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? Scene 23. To them, Lady Touchwood runs out affrighted, my lord after her, like a parson. Oh, I'm betrayed! Save me! Help me! Now what evasion, strumpet? Stand off! Let me go! Go, and thy own infamy pursue thee. You stare as you were all amazed. I don't wonder it, but too soon you'll know mine and that woman's shame. Scene the last. Lord Touchwood, Lord Froth, Lady Froth, Lady Pliant, Sir Paul, Cynthia, Mellifont, Maskwell. Mellifont disguised in a parson's habit and pulling in Maskwell. Nay, by heaven you shall be seen, careless your hand. Do you hold down your head? Yes, I am your chaplain. Look in the face of your injured friend, thou wonder of all falsehood. Are you silent, monster? Good heavens, how I believed and loved this man. Take him hence, for he's a disease to my sight. Secure that manifold villain. Servants seize him. Miracle of ingratitude. This is all very surprising. <laughs> Let me perish. You know I told you Saturn looked a little more angry than usual. We'll think of punishment at leisure. But let me hasten to do justice in rewarding virtue and wronged innocence. Nephew, I hope I have your pardon. And Cynthia's. We are your lordship's creatures. And be each other's comfort. Let me join your hands. Unwearied nights and wishing days attend you both. Mutual love, lasting health, and circling joys tread round each happy year of your long lives. Let secret villainy from hence be warned, howe'er in private mischiefs are conceived. Torture and shame attend their open birth. Like vipers in the womb, base treachery lies, still gnawing that whence first it did arise. No sooner born, but the vile parent dies. Exeunt Omnis Epilogue Could poets but foresee how plays would take, then they could tell what epilogues to make, whether to thank or blame their audience most. But that late knowledge does much hazard cost. Till dice are thrown, there's nothing won nor lost. So till the thief has stolen, he cannot know whether he shall escape the law or no. But poets run much greater hazards far than they who stand their trials at the bar. The law provides a curb for its own fury and suffers judges to direct the jury. But in this court, what difference does appear? For everyone's both judge and jury here. Nay, and what's worse, an executioner. All have a right and title to some part, each choosing that in which he has most art. The dreadful men of learning all confound, unless the fable's good and moral sound. The visor masks that are in pit and gallery approve or damn the repartee and raillery. The lady critics, who are better read, inquire if characters are nicely bred, if the soft things are penned and spoke with grace. They judge of action, too, and time and place, in which we do not doubt but their discerning for that's a kind of assignation learning. Bows judge of dress, the witlings judge of songs. The cuckoldom of ancient right to sits belongs. Thus poor poets the favor are denied, even to make exceptions when they're tried. Tis hard that they must every one admit. Methinks I see some faces in the pit, which must of consequence be foes to wit. You who can judge to sentence may proceed. But though he cannot write, let him be freed, at least from their contempt who cannot read. End of Act 5 End of The Double Dealer by William Congreve